Hello, everybody. It's uh, a great pleasure to um, greet <coughs> um, actually a series of all star speakers from uh, uh, Tokyo all the way to um, uh, the shores of Europe. We are delighted. Uh, I am Giulio Pugliese. I um, am a part time professor at uh, the uh, Robert Schumann Center the European University Institute and also a departmental lecturer <clears throat> at uh, the Nissan Institute of University of Oxford. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, greet you. Um, uh, we are going to have a series of uh, uh, great discussions uh, in a jointly organized uh, uh, conference, mini conference, if you want, through the European uh, uh, Japan Advanced Research Networks. And, the lineup, the stellar lineup is not really my merit, uh, but it's uh, Professor Marie Soderberg uh, merit, uh, merit uh, who uh, Marie was uh, kind, of, kind enough to arrange it. And uh, we are delighted uh, to push for this uh, <clears throat> jointly co-organized uh, uh, mini conference on really uh, issues pertaining uh, uh, Europe writ large, so it's the EU, <clears throat> European member states, but also the UK, and their uh, engagement with the so-called Indo-Pacific, especially in uh, um, through a close intent, if you want or not, we will see uh, whether uh, where, where there is indeed room for cooperation uh, with Japan. Um, and so, without further ado, I will uh, uh, leave uh, the floor. <clears throat> Uh, to uh, uh, Tokyo, where we have uh, Mr. Roland Honekamp, who is the head of the political section um, uh, at the delegation of the European Union to Japan. Uh, Roland will uh, give uh, a, uh, a short uh, overview of uh, EU-Japan relations, and <clears throat> we are very keen to know what is the official view from Tokyo. And uh, from that, we will pick up then and uh, continue with uh, our conference. Uh, Roland, the floor is yours for 10, 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giulio. And uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, so it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and also a privilege uh, to be back, uh, invited to this group. Thank you very much. And uh, I actually uh, uh, remember very fondly uh, when, uh, when I attended uh, for the last time this group, this must be approximately uh, two and a half years ago, when you, Marie, uh, graciously hosted everyone at the Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, so when I prepared my remarks uh, for today, I thought back to this event two and a half years ago, and obviously the period since then um, has seen you know, tremendous change, and uh, by, by no means uh, for the better. And um, to see how you know, this change has impacted upon the EU-Japan relationship, um, I um, have um, you know, prepared six points which I would like to make at the outset of the seminar. And uh, perhaps since uh, these days uh, are marked by you know, quite intense summitry uh, everywhere uh, in the world, um, you know, the G7 summit and, uh, and the meeting uh, between uh, the American president and the Russian president, and, uh, and also many other uh, smaller summits, uh, in uh, the Asia Pacific and elsewhere, I thought it would be useful uh, for us uh, to start with the EU Japan Summit, uh, which convened by video conference on the 27th uh, of May, so approximately uh, three uh, weeks ago. And um, so at this uh, summit meeting, which takes place once a year, uh, Prime Minister Suga met with Presidents von der Leyen and uh, Michel, and uh, the meeting was hosted by us, by the European Union, and the intention was since uh, the hosting function alternates from year to year, uh, the next summit would be hosted uh, by uh, Japan and could actually then uh, take uh, place in Tokyo in a physical format. Um, during the prime ministership of uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe and the previous uh, commission and council presidencies, the relationship had been marked uh, by a very good and close personal rapport between the leaders. So this is much more difficult in, um, you know, in current circumstances. And that's why um, a physical meeting um, you know, is, is necessary and cannot be replaced by a video conference. Nevertheless, the summit was a good discussion. And um, it also 
uh, resulted in a um, substantial joint statement where both the EU and Japan actually uh, um, put on paper and lined out their agreement uh, on all relevant uh, policy areas. And um, so you may have read uh, the joint statement, uh, but uh, for those of you who did not find it altogether illuminating, uh, you know, I propose uh, a few uh, annotated comments and, um, and to explain perhaps some background and give you some additional color on the negotiations and what was decided, because then um, it, it emerges um, what the priorities um, um, of, in the current of the current relationship are. And so I have singled out, I would make six points. And the first point uh, I would make is you know, that both Japan and the EU um, cooperate and um, you know, to varying degrees have uh, displayed leadership in the fight against uh, COVID-19. And um, it, it, was, it, was, it was officially welcomed by uh, the summit statement by the leaders um, that the EU has been you know, has played a leading role as a supplier of vaccines globally, including to Japan. So at this stage, the EU has uh, you know, far and away, no one else, uh, no other developed country in the OECD has uh, exported more than the EU, like 200 million vaccine doses to the world, of which approximately half have gone to Japan. And Japan, in fact, for a long time, um, exclusively depended on uh, EU imports of uh, vaccine doses for its domestic uh, vaccination rollout. So a crucial role for the EU, which was much appreciated by the Prime Minister and also by the responsible minister here, Minister Kono. And um, you may ask, you know, Japan has a, has a flourishing pharmaceutical base, yet no vaccine uh, had been developed by Japan. Um, and there are various reasons. And um, you know, we've got a number of Japanese experts today, but um, it, you know, does, this doesn't mean that Japan has not displayed its own kind of leadership in the fight against COVID. And uh, whether in the Quad or more prominently, um, together with the uh, EU, you know, Japan has led um, the, in, the in the COVAX facility and has come up with financing and actually has rallied support on the 2nd of June when it hosted uh, the Gavi COVAX uh, summit. And um, you know, has, in a sense, played a leading role in helping not only its immediate neighborhood, but the entire developing world um, to, um, to receive uh, vaccines. So I think, you know, overall, um, this has been uh, a, a good record of cooperation. Um, although Japan being an island has now completely uh, closed off and it's difficult for European citizens to travel uh, to Japan to exit and enter, whether it's researchers, whether it's students also, whether it's business people. So this is a you know, irritant in our relationship. The second point I would like to make is um, that on climate policy, um, since the turn um, of uh, the Japanese government and since uh, Prime Minister Suga's announcement to go for, um, for climate neutrality by 2050, yeah, both sides have, um, have, um, you know, have, become, have become much, much closer um, on this topic. However, I think it's fair to say you know, that the EU uh, it was getting by with a little help from its American friends. Um, so um, there was much pressure exerted by the Biden administration. And if you compare the ambition of the Green Alliance that was concluded uh, between Japan and the EU um, and um, the further discussions now in the G7, you know, it's quite clear um, that there was one major sticking point. And um, if the Green Alliance addresses the transition towards a you know, renewable energy-based society, the sticking point in Japan really is coal. And um, so we pressed uh, in our negotiations um, for, um, you know, pressed Japan for, a, um, for a, an end to, uh, to subsidies and to the financing of coal-powered uh, plants uh, elsewhere, um, and also to a phasing out of coal uh, in uh, Japan itself. Now, this is problematic. And so we have not gotten exactly where we wanted uh, to go, but um, you know it's been it's been an improvement um, when compared to you know, say a year ago. The third point I would like to make is um, the Indo-Pacific. So on the 16th of April, the EU has adopted council conclusions for um, a uh, its own strategic approach towards the Indo-Pacific, and um, you can see um, that one uh, a speaker in uh, in today's panel. Is, uh, is looking at the EU as a bystander in this, uh, in this region. But it's obviously not the case. 
um, because um, the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca are key, um, you know, sea lanes for the supply of both Japan and the EU. So we have a huge stake in this region. It was going to be um, you know, two thirds of uh, global economic growth will originate uh, in the Indo-Pacific going forward in all likelihood. Um, and uh, you know, a third of uh, global arms spending and defense spending is done in that region. It's of huge strategic uh, relevance. And since uh, some of our member states, Germany, France, and the Netherlands already had an Indo-Pacific uh, strategy in place, the EU felt uh, compelled to go forward and formulate uh, its own uh, strategy here. And in the summit statement um, and in the proceedings itself, you know, the term of the free and open Indo-Pacific quite contested until recently, and the EU would not have embraced the term as a political vision, but the free and open Pacific was actually mentioned and also retained as a term in the summit statement. So that's um, quite, um, um, a, that, that's, that's, that's an important and new development. And in particular so because um, Prime Foreign Minister Motegi actually met with the EU foreign ministers in late January and had a discussion about this. So he, the Japanese government may, you know, may feel actually a, you know, a have, of have sense of ownership in the sense of having played a role in the formulation of that strategy. So that's quite uh, positive and important and actually places the bilateral relationship uh, between Japan and the EU on a much uh, uh, more solid footing than before. Uh, number four, the fourth point is uh, foreign policy, and here it's predominantly China. So now almost uh, famously in the summit uh, statement, um, the sentence um, uh, appeared and was uh, uh, underwritten by both sides. We underscore the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and encourage the peaceful resolution of cross-strait issues. So what was first, um, was first uh, articulated um, in uh, Washington DC, when Prime Minister Suga met the American president, then actually um, made it into the G7 foreign ministers community and was then actually also uh, kept in the, you know, as an EU position in the summit statement. And obviously was repeated now by the G7 um, 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 uh, leaders statement. So that's uh, this, this open criticism um, of China and um, the, the articulation of serious concern when it comes to uh, attempts to change unilaterally the status quo in the region. That's certainly um, a, um, a development that's very much welcomed by Tokyo and something which uh, you know, in the EU two and a half years ago, uh, when we last met in this setting, would have been uh, unimaginable. Um, number five, and connected to this, the fifth point, um, on foreign policy, I would argue there has been much progress uh, made in the past 24 months on security and defense. And the old criticism of the EU is, of course, you know, how many divisions or how many frigates has the EU got? But you know, in a sense, that misses the point because, um, like you know, like in almost every other area, the EU operates um, uh, on the basis of you know, attributed competences and attributed material. And so, if member states put at the disposition, at the disposal of the EU, uh, hard assets, then the EU will use them. And um, so in Djibouti, this is done in our operation Atalanta. And in late May, we had a joint port call actually, when uh, you know, Japanese naval self-defense forces um, participated alongside European uh, naval forces in an anti-piracy uh, exercise there. So very important. Um, and again, something uh, that had not happened uh, until recently. Um, and um, it, you know, there are a number of developments in this area, such as the instrument of coordinated maritime presence when our member states send frigates. The Germans would send a frigate, uh, the Dutch um, and uh, the French just had exercise about, I think, two and a half weeks ago in, uh, uh, down in uh, Kyushu. And so um, this is an area, and not only in terms of maritime security, but also in terms of you know, cyber and uh, talks about disinformation, um, space. So there is a lot going on. And it's been one area where um, cooperation has been strengthened. And then number six, um, and uh, last, but by no means uh, least, um, the uh, issues of democracy and human rights. So uh, obviously, um, you know, human rights uh, have become under attack in many parts of the world. And um, so it's actually with a renewed sense of urgency that these, uh, that these um, topics you know, figure in, uh, in the relationship. And um, it's fair to say that Japan has slightly shifted actually its position 
And uh, if you if you if you look at what has been uh, agreed, for instance, on Myanmar, uh, Japan would be loath to criticize uh, other uh, ASEAN members, uh, you know, on domestic on domestic issues. But uh, you know, Japan now joins the EU in condemning in the strongest terms the military coup in Myanmar. So um, you know, there is so some rapprochement on human rights, not everywhere. Um, I would recall Japan has not got the equivalent of a Magnitsky Act or the EU um, uh, global human rights sanctions regime. Um, so still, you know, much more reluctant on the Japanese side to uh, see human rights as a, an important foreign policy tool, but nevertheless, important rapprochement. So these were the six points uh, I wanted to make uh, here uh, at the outset. And while these are necessarily uh, selective, perhaps um, you know, they can give an sort of impulse to what's being discussed in the coming panels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, thank you for uh, essentially taking stock of latest developments uh, <clears throat> in Japan, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, but also in the EU-Japan summit, uh, and uh, really also the EU's uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, and for giving really an overview of what you think are the most important uh, developments. Uh, thank you for your time. We know that you're very busy. And uh, this is uh, for all uh, attendees. Uh, you will be able to ask questions and make comments, but uh, uh, to all panelists, uh, because of course we are on a tight schedule, and uh, we are going to transition now to uh, uh, to the panels. So uh, one more time, uh, on behalf of everybody, Roland, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So now we will transition to um, the first panel, chaired uh, by the inimit uh, inimitable uh, Ken Endo, who is uh, also uh, at the EUI as uh, co-lead of this uh, fantastic EU Asia project. And uh, I'll leave the floor to Ken, who will do, um, who will chair and introduce everybody. Great. Thank you very much indeed, and hello to everybody. Um, uh, my name is Ken Endo. And thanks for uh, Marie and Julio for organizing this uh, excellent conference. Now, um, you know, I, I am quite pleased to have this um, timely uh, event. Um, I hope that uh, you're not just uh, here to uh, somewhat uh, show solidarity to the, you know, Japan's obsession to China. But uh, I think this is a very important time and subject. Um, I think um, um, uh, we, uh, uh, we need to prepare for the uh, wide variety of uh, policy options facing this uh, such a rapidly changing international environment. Um, so uh, I've just uh, wanted to thank uh, for the organizers to organize, you know, they have this event. And I was also particularly pleased to see some of my old friends, uh, you know, particularly Chris. Uh, I don't know how, how many, I think almost two decades I haven't met you, but anyway, uh, it's good to, to, to be reconnected through this event. Now, um, the, uh, Julio and Mary, uh, you know, assembled excellent uh, speakers for this conference and particularly in this first session, I'm quite honored to announce that we have excellent panels. Um, first, of course, Alex, uh, uh, you know, from Pavia. Um, uh, you're going to talk about Europe and HOIP. And the uh, Patrick Storm and Richard Nakamula, uh, respectively from Stockholm School of Economics and University of uh, Göteborg, talking about the EPA, uh, EU Japan, and the Chris uh, from Warwick uh, to talk about UK Japan, uh, which will be followed by the uh, uh, comments uh, from uh, Mary from Stockholm. So uh, each presenter has uh, 10 minutes and the uh, same goes to the uh, commentators. So, Pat uh, sorry, Alex, can you kick off please? Of course I can. I, thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, Marie, for, for having me. Uh, good to see all of all of you again. Um, uh, what I'm what I'm about to say in nine nine minutes and fifty five seconds now is going to be also on paper in an eleven thousand word um, paper, which will be published at the uh, with, with Julio and Ken here in, in Florence. Uh, I've already received a lot of comments from from Julio and from Marie. Thank you very much for this. It's a whole lot of uh, 
you know, uh, it's, it's, it means more work, but, but the comments are very, very good. So I'll, I'll, I'll take them on board, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, appreciate them. So, you know, if you want to find out more um, and follow up on my, 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 what will now be provocative comments on the Indo-Pacific and the EU involvement in it, you can read that in the paper. And again, thanks for, for having me and good to see so many of you again. Okay, um, now the premise, I think uh, Roland you know, has, has, has said it already in, very, in a very direct manner. Uh, and of course he, he will do this because he's, he's like myself, you know, Germans and we tend to be very direct. So um, I'm not gonna mince my words here, here either, uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, is that, you know, the Indo-Pacific or the, the, the increased European in interest in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the, uh, the guidelines will, which I will be uh, discussing, uh, the, the French guidelines, the German guidelines, the European, uh, the EU guidelines that have been published in uh, April um, uh, 2021, 20, just very recently, um, you know, exist, okay, because of China. You know, it's all about China. The premise is, uh, you know, it's Chinese uh, uh, territorial expansionism in the region, uh, plus, you know, the, uh, the sideshows, uh, if you want to call it this way, it's a bit more, you know, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Xinjiang, and, and, and other issues that, uh, that, that are controversial. And, you know, and, and, you know Taiwan... has become again very much you know very very concrete sorry about this uh chinese um chinese uh uh intrusion into into into, into taiwanese controlled airspace so it's it's not only about uh, the south china sea maybe it's about above all uh, the south china sea but it's also about other issues the side shows china is a regional bully um changing the territorial status quo which, which I cite in the uh, in the paper, a lot of satellite uh, satellite pictures. Really, um, you know, with all due respect to uh, to, uh, to to our friends and colleagues in China, uh, which clearly demonstrate, um, you know, provide ample evidence uh, that uh, that China is building military bases on disputed islands and has been building artificial islands around disputed islands in the South China Sea. So if you are, if you doubt this, or of any of our, any of you doubt this also in the audience, um, you know, just have a look at the satellite pictures. I've done this and, um, you know, China's building runways, hangars, um, and is building full-fledged military bases on islands that might not belong to China, you know, and, you know, so they're this uh, uh, undeterred. And that, of course, will lead us to also the question, you know, what the, what the, what the possible end game and the possible actual policies on the ground uh, could be uh, that the European Union or European member states will be uh, adopting in order to deter those territorial expansions. So this is this is um, uh, this is 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 very clear. Of course, as far as China is concerned, uh, you know there they are, and, and I think we need to we need to take this into account, and we need to to take this also. Um, well, we don't have to take this on board, but we need to you know to see. Uh, where the Chinese government is coming from. Of course, there are no territorial disputes in the South China Sea. It belongs to China, you know. Look at the Ming Dynasty maps um, and look at the Qing Dynasty maps. I've, I've, I have looked at them. I have been shown them in China many, many times. I'm not looking at them anymore because I don't get invited to China anymore. Um, um, but, you know, uh, the, the South China Sea belongs to China. You know, there are no territorial disputes. 97.8% of the South China Sea is Chinese territory, including all those islands, as far as China is concerned. So there are no disputes in the South China Sea, as far as China is concerned. The reality, of course, is very different. We all have seen the, the verdict of the, uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2016, and, and you know, which, which uh, ruled that uh, China's territorial claims, are, are many of them, or most of them, uh, you know, um, are, are, uh, you know, are not uh, legitimate. You know, the, um, but of course, China does, of course, ignore that ruling the uh, the permit of corporate arbitration doesn't have you know legally binding authority you know cannot stop china from from building uh you know military bases and civilian facilities on disputed islands you know but who can you know who, and that that of course is is a question that that you know might or might not accompany us in in the years um in the years to come you know and again what is the end game is uh, is the end game um you know the eu and the us of course because the us hasn't done anything about uh, about Chinese territorial expansionism, either is the end game going to be, you know, watching from a distance and seeing how, how China is, is building its military bases, or is it, or is it going to be something else at some point? You know, depending on what China does, is it going to be a sea blockade? Is it going to be, uh, you know, an anti-access uh, policy jointly ado adopted by, by 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 Europe and the Quad that, that, that has been mentioned 
for what is the end game? What, what are the actual policies on the ground if this goes on undeterred? Who knows? Okay, that's uh, uh, probably the question. Briefly, um, I'm running out of time already and I haven't even started yet. Um, that's fairly typical. Um, you know, I've, in the paper, I have, I've had a look at, um, at, the, at the three, um, uh, at the three uh, Indo-Pacific policy papers, the one, uh, the French one, adopted in 2018. I'll, I'll come back to this later. Uh, the one uh, that Germany adopted in 2020, which is a 75 pages long, uh, you know, and with all due respect to, uh, to German foreign policy makers, which is a 75 uh, pages long policy paper, which is listing everything and nothing. There's a long list. It is a, it is a shopping list of unresolved issues in the Indo-Pacific and being very, very vague, you know, being very, very general sounding, um, uh, not mentioning Taiwan once. I will get back to this, although, you know, Taiwan clearly is, uh, you know, a hotspot in regional security in the Indo-Pacific and calling just like the European, um, uh, European um, or the EU in the Pacific policy paper, and, and maybe Holland wants to set the record straight later on, but I, uh, you know, calling uh, the Indo-Pacific an ASEAN-centered security environment. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe that's debatable, and I, and I stand to be corrected, but calling the Indo-Pacific, you know, an ASEAN-centered security environment is, is probably a bit of a stretch, to put it this way, because ASEAN really doesn't have any role whatsoever um, going beyond uh, informal consultations. I'm not saying this is bad. Uh, it's better to talk to each other than and talking about each other. But it's certainly, at least from from, from where I'm standing, is certainly not an ASEAN-centered security environment. And the Euro and the uh, the German uh, Indo-Pacific policymakers, I've counted it, is mentioning ASEAN as um, you know as the central organ and the institution or forum of Indo-Pacific security 66 times. I don't know um, who, you know what has driven you know foreign policymakers there in Germany to uh, to insist uh, that ASEAN. Uh, is uh, is at the center of uh, of um, you know regional security discussions. I really don't know uh, why, why why that is the case. Of course, what I also do elaborate. I will not do this here because really I don't have any time. I, I talk about um, also about you know on the one hand increased European interest in in the Indo Pacific, you know, and showing naval presence. We talked about the frigate uh, that that is yeah, the German one that is about to set sail. I'll come back to this later. Uh, the French there, of course. Uh, the UK is thinking about doing that. Uh, uh, about cooperating with, uh, with with the Quad and all of this. On the one hand, on the other hand, then the European Union uh, signing uh, the uh, the EU China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, you know, despite all of the concerns, you know, of course, the uh, the EU China Trade uh, and Investment Agreement is not going anywhere. Of course, after after uh, uh, the Chinese government imposed economic sanctions, so, sorry, imposed sanctions on European politicians and European scholars. Um, so it's not going to be uh, adopted anytime soon, if ever. It's not going to go through the European Parliament. That's for sure, because because some of the European parliaments, which have to decide um, on the on the adoption of the uh, agreement, have been. Um, have been subject to uh, to Chinese sanctions, so this is not you know it's, it's a no brainer. This is not going anywhere. But you know that of course was Germany pushing very hard for the EU Commission, um, you know uh, headed by by German. Maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe not uh, to to push th that agreement through uh, the EU Commission. But of course it is not going anywhere. Briefly, uh, can if I may an another couple of minutes? Uh, do I? Yeah, is that okay? How much? To really? <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> it's really bad. Um, uh, the French, the French policy paper, and like, like I said, 2018, the French point of departure and the French, offi French officials are making this very clear. Um, it's always their first sentence. France is a resident power. You know, there are 1.6 million French citizens living in the region. Okay. Living in, in, in islands of, uh, of Mayotte, uh, La, La Réunion, scattered islands, uh, the French Southern uh, and Antarctic territories and the Southern part of the Indian Ocean, New Caledonia, Wallis, Futuna, French Polynesia, Clipperton Islands, um, so on and so forth. Of course, it's not con controversial, it's not uncontroversial. Some of those countries, you know, are looking for independence. This is of course a hangover of bad old colonialism, but you know, uh, for now they are French citizens. And so France is saying, we are not uh, only defending uh, economic interests uh, like, like the Germans, but also French uh, citizens living in the region. So this is the uh, uh, distinctive um, and very, uh, you know, clear cut, you know, in a, in a clear cut manner defined French approach. France is a resident power, so has much more to defend um, uh, than Germany, for example, or other European countries, which are not residents power, powers in, 
in, in, in the region. Uh, President Macron has been very interested in this and uh, he, he made uh, a number of, of speeches in 2018 and 19 where he spoke about, you know, uh, an axis of cooperation between France, Canberra, Delhi and Paris. Uh, he spoke on, on, on various occasions uh, of cooperating with the Quad, with, with Japan, of course, with, uh, with, uh, with Australia, India uh, um, and, 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 uh, and, and Japan, um, sorry, and Australia. Um, and the, sorry, the US, so the Quad US, uh, and that was repeated in 2019 when uh, Macron positioned France as a balancing power, again, speaking of cooperation with, with the Quad, what that, that will exactly be, whether, whether it will be France joining, you know, uh, the Quad countries and patrolling the East China Sea or the South China Sea remains yet to be seen. It's early days, but again, there is willingness and that's not unusual, that's not, uh, uh, or that's very comprehensible. Of um, you know uh, of of hooking up, teaming up with the like-minded democracies in the region, and these are the Quad countries, and that's of course, uh, of course, it's it, of course it's deterring China. It is containment. You know, uh, uh, when when it, when it breaks like a duck, it probably is a duck, and that of course is 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 uh, is part of a China uh, containment policies. It's not being referred to as such, but clearly is. You know, there there really um, no no doubt about this. Last thing, um, um, sorry, can do I have two two more minutes? Is that okay? He didn't say no, he said yes. Okay, so uh, the German one, um, uh, the German policy paper, like I said, ASEAN centered security, I'm not sure what, what that means. Um, Germany insisting on the fact and that, that there becomes, and we can talk about this, uh, support uh, saying that, you know, it's ASEAN centered and we still have the code of conduct between between ASEAN and, 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 and China. You know, the code of conduct allegedly is uh, is uh, managing territorial disputes in the region, but that really in reality, and, and we scholars know that is no longer the case. The code that has been in place since 2002 is not being respected due to the fact that China is building, you know, military bases and civilian facilities on, on disputed islands. So the code of conduct is really not uh, no longer worth uh, the paper that's written on, but the German government on the policy paper is saying, no, the code of conduct is still very much alive. It's still, you know, uh, the code to, to, to mark as regards to you know, negotiations between ASEAN countries or claimant countries China, but that's not the really, that's clearly not the case because China, and again, I promise not to mince my word, China, on territorial disputes with our country and not, not on a multilateral basis. I think has uh, the station, in fact, the station. So there are no negotiations going on. Sometimes China um, is saying as such. The German Navy, like like Roland uh, mentioned earlier, is um, sailing towards um, the, um, the East, even sailing into the South China Sea starting in August. Um, but that 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 uh, and write this in, in and I think there is a case to admit could even be counterproductive because it is sailing into the South China Sea. But it, but the German Navy and that and I think that's very important. It's made it very clear that it will not be sailing into the 12 nautical miles uh, zone um, claimed by China as uh, as as its economic uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, by doing that, the German Navy and I think that's important to point out is acknowledging indirectly but also directly. You know Chinese territorial claims. You know uh, because if China, if the German government or, or other European governments did not think that those di that those territories are disputed, there would there would be no EEZ to violate. But but the German Navy saying, well, we will sail through uh, the South China, we will not de facto uh, violating uh, you know Chinese territorial integrity uh, around those dis disputed islands, which means that the mission could be counterproductive. Uh, innocent passage is uh, this mess this. Uh, operation will be called. Uh, this has been done in the US also in, in the past. So also the, U, the US sometimes sailed into that uh, 12 nautical miles zone, but also called its operations, uh, the Freedom of Navigation Operations, um, FONPs in the South China Sea, um, Innocent Passage um, as well. You know, it's, it's setting towards the Indian Ocean that is positive per se, it's sending a signal, uh, but, uh, and of course it will ruffle some feathers in, 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 in Beijing, but it will, um, could be uh, potentially counterproductive because it is indirectly um, acknowledging Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea. I'm um, looking at this. Can I say really one more word on the EU, but or I can stop myself. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, the EU policy paper, uh, the headline that, that came out as soon as it was adopted, sorry about this guys, that I, um, I'm, I'm gonna pay you back in time next time I, 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 I organize something. Um, naval, meaningful naval presence uh, 
of the EU and in the Indo-Pacific. Okay, this is this is important. Uh, Roland talked about this, and this is a certainly step ahead. Will remain will remain you know to be seen what that means. You know how meaningful the presence uh, will be, what they will be doing. Uh, you know how you know other European countries will be joining the French, the Germans, and others. You know in you know, um, establishing this name, meaningful naval presence. The uh, uh, Rola talked about this, who, who, who the elephant in the room is, of course. Um, you know, um, um, you know the, the, the EU short paper is very explicit about, about, uh, about, about the issues on, on the table without naming China. It's disinformation, disregard of international law, cybersecurity, uh, and uh, the EU, and again, that this remains to be remains to be seen, is even mentioning, uh, you know, cooperation between between Asian interests of like-minded democracies and the European Union in the framework of a CSDP missions. Uh, this, uh, of course, sounds very good, but the devil, of course, will be the details. Uh, meaning, it will remain to be seen how you know European CDP, CDP missions, you know, can be a part of uh, of any anything resembling joint. Uh, European Asian missions um, in the region. Uh, but I have to say, last last sentence, uh, the paper is good. The European policy paper is, is very good. And I'm not saying this because Roland is still in the room here. Um, it is it is much better than, than, than previous EU policy papers, very concrete um, and much better than the German paper. That's it. Uh, sorry about this, Ken. Um, uh, um, um, you know, uh, do not give me any more space. Even later on, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm a dead, uh, and ready. Thank you very much for this. OK, I, I look forward the next next conference that you chair but anyway thank you very much for the wonderful overview and then you have traced effectively the growing interest of europe into this region of indo-pacific and uh, particularly focusing on germany and france uh, and the eu afterward and uh, and also the area of uh, south china sea the problem always may lie in the sort of, you know, there is a growing, you know, infla you know inflation of rhetorics, uh, but, you know, there might be some widening gap between the, you know, what, what really can be done. Yeah, but anyway, uh, I'm sure the Maori is going to touch upon it. Now, uh, so uh, may I move to uh, Patrick and Richard? Are you going to present all together or one by one? Uh, but anyway, in the, space of something like 10 plus minutes, please. I will share my screen here. Um, um, so I will do the presentation. My name is Patrick Stram, and this is a joint um, presentation together with uh, Rickard Nakamura from University of Gothenburg. And uh, Rickard very kindly um, uh, agreed to take all the difficult questions after the presentation. So I was very happy with, with that division of labor uh, this morning. Uh, so we're going to dig into the EU-Japan EPA, where we will uh, take stock of, of where we're standing now, but uh, maybe more importantly, try to uh, push ahead with some of the questions that we find as very important for the future um, economic and political economic uh, relationship between uh, Japan and uh, the EU. So we'll give you a general overview. We will try to, to taste take stock of where we are now. We will sketch out the future areas of the EPA and we will finish off by conclusions and recommendations. So I think that would be the, the most interesting part where we could have a conversation on where the EU-Japan uh, relation is, is going uh, in the future. First of all, uh, let me give you a bit of a setting. Of course, the global political economic setting is impacting both the EU and Japan. Uh, we see that EU and Japan um, is intertwined into increased implications of geoeconomics, not only political aspects. And we have seen over the years that Japan and the EU have tried to strengthen their um, relationship, but also their um, uh, independent standing in the, the global economy. Uh, EU, for instance, launched the Global Europe. Uh, we've seen the EU-Japan economic partnership and uh, taking um, effect back in February 2019. We have also have the strategic partnership agreement uh, that has kind of put the, 
the, the platform for, for future relationship, uh, which we will come back to. We see uh, that uh, there is a service trade deficit for Japan in relation to, to um, the EU. Uh, in connection to the EPA and the SPA, we have also the implications of Brexit that we will also touch upon. Um, and the ongoing business reinvention that Shard and others are talking about in relation to businesses in Japan and how they operate in, in the European context is also something which is, is interesting for the, the firm level if we move down uh, in, in the structures. We see... Um, FDI imbalances that needs to be tackled and a whole range of issues as standardization, regulatory harmonization, settlements on IP and so on and so forth uh, for the future. Just to give you a bit of a, a picture, um, Japan's exports and imports of goods uh, as share of world uh, trade has declined over the years. So that's something that, that has, it needs to be taken into to account. Uh, from this, we see the export of Japan, um, where the EU has uh, slightly been declining over the years. And of course, where the big change is that China has increased rapidly and uh, replaced the US as the, the, the biggest uh, player. Um, a similar uh, chart, if we look at Japan's imports of goods uh, by origin, China again is the main uh, partner there. The EU has uh, also declined somewhat, but also the United States, as we can see from, from this chart. Um, and finally, uh, from the European side that uh, we look at trade with Japan has uh, declined, uh, both in terms of exports and imports. So that's a kind of uh, the starting platform, which is important to bear with us that, that from the, both the European point of view and the EU point of view and Japan's point of view, it's a kind of a defensive um, uh, mechanism to try to regain some of the strengths that both these entities have had in the um, trade area and the political economy of, of the world economy. I think one of the, the, the main important parts here is that uh, the EPA and the SPA, the Strategic Partnership Agreement, um, actually uh, sets a joint platform. And that is something which, which uh, will be key for the future. So um, while the, the, the liberal and multilateral world uh, view is under pressure, these two um, frameworks have become very important for Japan and, and the EU to push forward with the rules-based uh, world and China and the US seem to be occupied with their own business, both in, in, in trade and security. Uh, and that, we argue, would leave room for navigation when it comes to the EU and Japan, uh, both uh, on the basis of the SPA, but also through the rather broad, co broad coverage and, and, and complement that we see in the, the economic partnership uh, agreement. If we, we look at the areas where the SPA has crystallized, um, it seems that connectivity, digitalization, climate change and security will be on the table as areas for, for moving ahead. And, and we think that these areas very clearly will tap into some of the most important parts of the, the EPA. Um, and of then the SPA is not really a, a communicare style type of product, but it sets a scene of a legally binding framework that these two entities and, and parties should, should work with. Um, having said that, of course, the, we could also say that the SPA seemed to have a kind of an incremental start with a slow takeoff, but probably the COVID uh, pandemic has, uh, has shown the importance and probably accelerated some of the areas in terms of connectivity digitalization, security, and climate change. So that could be the push that, uh, that the relationship well, uh, well needed. So a few words about the, the EPA, uh, where we stand currently. Uh, one of the, 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 the main uh, takeaways from, from signing and, and implementing the EPA seems to be the strengthening and the commitment of strengthening uh, for relations and a positive spin that the EU and Japan is serious about connecting these two very large trading uh, entities. And of course, that impacts even then small SMEs on the ground trying to, to move in either direction. Uh, direction. Um, having said that, overall tariff, re tariff reduction should generate uh, additional trade, but we see that for the long run, it would probably be the, the more elimination of non-tariff barriers, regulatory harmonization and trade facilitation that would probably have a more profound uh, effect on, on trade. And uh, if you look at the EPA in, in general from the start, it was not that it was 
tariffs that were the main issue, but how could you develop the, the um, overall economic uh, connection between these uh, entities? Of course, uh, it's, it's a relatively short time period since it has come into effect. Um, we've seen that merchandise trade has increased with around 6%. Uh, areas that was expected to have a, a, a quick gain, agri-food, industrial textile, leather, has increased in, in the areas of about 10%, uh, which was really uh, expected. Um, we've seen in relation to, to um, the, the Brexit uh, that where there is a changing industrial footprint in both the UK and the EU. And of course, this change of industrial footprint uh, might also affect um, trade flows and future FDI flows in relation to, to the EU uh, in general. And we already seen, and that, that's of course an area that will be important for the future, that uh, there has been re relocation of units um, inside the EU rather than expanding the production facilities uh, in Japan. And we've seen that also in areas of, of finance and professional uh, business services uh, and the like uh, as well. If we then should try to carve out uh, from, from the perspective that the Rickard and I has worked with, uh, have worked with here, uh, the, the future important areas of the EPA. Um, it seems to be services, servitization, the combination of manufacturing and services or the product service system approach, uh, where more and more the value is actually being generated from uh, knowledge content and service content in the, the production chain. Um, digital services, just looking at the, the, uh, the platform that we're using here now, Zoom and others, uh, will definitely increase uh, in the future. Um, sustainability and the green economy will be there on the table. Um, the complexity of the global value chains and uh, the regional value chains in, in Asia and, and Europe uh, is another area where you have the complexity of the, the company level and the, the more microeconomic level. Um, the recent RCEP agreement uh, in Southeast Asia with Japan, Korea and, and China will of course also act as an important platform where you might see um, connections between the EPA and uh, the commitment to, to the region. Um, the whole area of trade measurement and how you connect that to the business level. So if you would like to do any viable policy, you of course have to have uh, as stringent as possible uh, measurements for, for that. And, and finally, in the question of, of FDI, uh, one could ask whether there is a need for an investment arbitration agreement. That is something which is still on the table. It hasn't been concluded. Um, if that's a, a sign of that there are limited problems in the area or not, that uh, remains to, to be seen, we think. So uh, a set of conclusions before we move into the policy recommendations that we carved out for, for this specific uh, brief that will also be published um, after this uh, session. We clearly see a blur of political economy and geoeconomics. It's very different, difficult to, to keep them separated and keep them apart. Um, we clearly see after now a couple of years of the EPA and the SPA, the need of moving these two in parallel. And I think that could next to the argument of, of political economy and geoeconomics uh, being blurred. It is also clear that we see high knowledge economies, both in Japan and the EU, and collaboration in many sectors as key for pushing some of the areas uh, that are important, not only for, for the mature economies, but others. Um, the, the Hitachi uh, uh, purchase uh, of ABB power grids, for instance, is one such example where we see uh, high-end industrial collaboration. Uh, Long-term uh, impact of, of Brexit is yet there to be seen, exactly how that would play into the restructuring of Japanese industrial footprint inside the European uh, single internal market. But it's very clear that the, the single internal market as such will definitely uh, be key for the future relationship uh, with the Japanese companies. So we will finish off by uh, sharing a few of the um, policy recommendations that we see. Um, and we, we really see the economic partnership agreement as a trade facilitator. It, it's really a stepping stone type of agreement that can be, be utilized as, as a showcase within the rules-based order in how um, mature economies uh, with a clear um, vision actually work together. Um, 
we will we'll need to see more and better developed connections to, to RCEP in order also to push the, the argument of, of the wider rules-based opportunity that this actually presents with Japan and, and um, China and, and Korea also being inside that um, agreement. Um, we do believe that uh, it's necessary to, to formulate strategic policies in, in the area of infrastructure, global health, digitalization, sustainability, and data and connectivity. And uh, that is, is needed in order for pushing economic recovery uh, in the respective uh, economies. Um, as I said uh, prior, services uh, will be an important area for the EPA development, yet it hasn't been, it's there, but uh, more can be done. Uh, there is a need for business to business solutions Transfer data uh, is, of course, crucial uh, for both uh, Japan and the EU. And I think that is something which the, the uh, pandemic has really pushed uh, recently. Uh, and on the back of that, we see that the areas of digital services, e-commerce markets um, is, is probably going to expand even further in Japan and the EU. So the question is, how do you, how do you facilitate that? How do you increase the, the possibility for job creation, social cohesion, trade facilitation? Um, well, we believe that, that the regulatory transparency and market entry facilitation uh, will probably be high uh, up on that uh, agenda. Um, but to be able, as I said, to develop any viable policies, you need to know what are the areas you're looking into, how do you measure them, and how do you see, and where do you see the value being generated in these global and, and regional production chains. And finally, uh, we believe strongly that uh, the, 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 the push for um, economic stimulus uh, in the EU and, and Japan, which bear the mark of, of a green economy, uh, such as the new green deal and the, the discussions in Japan, pushing for carbon neutrality in the economy in 2050, um, also brings a lot of opportunities, how you can push uh, green economy uh, parts within the framework of both the EPA and the SPA. And with that, we say thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Um, um, it's an excellent overview of the current state of EU Japan in terms of the economy, uh, as well as the uh, you know the relevant uh, you know identification of tasks and the uh, hence the policy recommendations for the future. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, you know, I, I have noticed in one of the sections of the EU Japan uh, summit uh, a few years ago, a few weeks ago that we have we're going to form a green alliance, right? So perhaps the uh, the uh, some of the uh, issue areas maybe uh, being may be covered by the two two sides now. Great. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the uh, the other part of the the, the Europe, the uh, UK. Um, Chris, can you take the floor, please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll um, put, uh, put some slides. So I'm going to try and share. Hopefully, this will work. Um, let's see, is it working? Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Great. Okay. So I've got a few a few slides. Um, um, I'll, I'll try not to dwell on too many of them. Um, it's really just to frame my my talk. Thanks again for the invitation, and thanks, Ken. It's very nice to see you again. It's delightful to see everybody again. Uh, I spent the last sort of, sixteen months fighting a pandemic, so it's quite nice to at my own institution. So it's nice to talk about something a bit different. Uh, I'm going to talk about this this topic of UK Japan strategic convergence post Brexit, with a focus on uh, maritime maritime security. Um, so uh, uh, some of this work comes out of um, some, some uh, early initial projects I was doing at Wasadi University and, and, Univ and Todai actually around, around the possibilities for post um, Brexit UK Japan cooperation. Uh, and then of course that work was rudely interrupted by, by the pandemic. Um, but essentially what I'm gonna do today is um, I'll, 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 the first half of the talk is setting out a little bit about the, the whole kind of discourse around strategic convergence of UK and Japan 
and this focus on uh, security cooperation, particularly maritime security and cooperation and, nav and, and naval exercises. And then the second half, we'll look a little bit more at the um, uh, the sort of uh, how to understand the, the exactly to sort of try and conceptualize what the UK and Japan might be doing and how much real convergence there might be, but also some of the some of the problems that uh, I think are really underlying are under the surface and, and, and may also stymie some of the future possibilities for cooperation. So um, um, I, I won't dwell too much on, the, as I said, on the first half of the, of, of the slides of, in this talk. Um, I think that the context is, is pretty well known. Uh, I mean, on the UK side, there's this whole uh, discussion around um, you know, the UK's search for uh, something called Global Britain, which we don't quite know what that is yet. Um, but essentially what the UK is doing is it's, it's looking for new partners in the run-up, both in the run-up to Brexit and then obviously post-Brexit. It's looking for new strategic partners to, to help in this whole idea of, of, of Global Britain. Uh, and more recently, we've had, um, we've had the Integrated uh, Defence and Security Review uh, in April, uh, where the UK starts to talk about very much about the tilt to the Indo-Pacific. So the, the Indo-Pacific has a very, very strong emphasis for this whole idea of, of Global Britain. And of course, Japan has, has both both pre-Brexit, pre but also post-Brexit, Japan has been fixed on very much as, the, as if you like, the closest of Japan, of, of the UK's future strategic partners. So, um, and then if you look on the UK side, um, again, some similarities really, um, I mean, obviously, UK Japan relations are always pretty good. Uh, and when the UK was a member of the EU, then um, uh, the UK was in some ways a sort of entry point or a bridge for for the for Japan into into the EU economically, but also politically uh, to some extent. Uh, but even post uh, post Brexit, I think Japan still regards the UK as a really important partner, uh, or it says it does anyway, um, because it really it really aligns very closely with the whole Japanese national security strategy. The, the, the search to diversify, uh, to find new strategic, additional strategic partners, some of the work that Paul, Paul's done uh, in this area. And of course, the UK has seemed to share this, this commitment to the rules-based international order. So uh, from, from the Japanese perspective, the UK fits very well to uh, Japanese strategy. And both sides have um, really um, confirmed this in, in, in how they talk about um, uh in, in various bilateral summits and so on they talk about shared values and interests and converging strategies and so on and then within this strategic convergence there's been a lot of discussion around um, enhanced security cooperation in 2017 there was a joint declaration on security cooperation many areas of cooperation outlined and then in, in many ways a centerpiece of this uh of of, of this this drive for increased security cooperation there's been a lot of talk about maritime security uh, and, and joint exercise. And some of this echoes what, what, what uh, Axel was saying, I think in terms of some European individual states and EU uh, in thinking about how to, how to approach the Indo-Pacific. Um, why maritime security cooperation? Well, again, you know, um, both uh, the, the individual respective strategies of the UK and Japan, lots of talk about being island nations, maritime states, uh, wanting a, um, you know, open uh, sea, sea lanes and so on. So you can see that the, the strategies map onto each other pretty well. And again, in, in, in the various joint declarations and statements and so on, um, uh, this is reflected back in terms of you know, how, how the two sides share, share lots of interests. And the UK particularly talks about its interest in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in the South China Sea, East China Sea. Uh, and again, you can see this from the UK integrated review. Uh, and the UK has really gone in, into overdrive, I think, in terms of thinking about this whole maritime security aspect. Um, this, uh, there's a couple of images here, but the one on the left uh, and the one at the top, they're taken from the integrated uh, review. Uh, and the UK has, obviously now the UK has two, two of these splendid aircraft carriers, uh, the Queen Elizabeth and the Prince of Wales. The Queen Elizabeth is on its way uh, to the Indo-Pacific, I think since last month. Uh, and it's just a huge amount of, if you like, um, Political and strategic capital invested in this whole, this whole, uh, um, well, these ships really, and uh, symbols of of the UK's commitment and its tilt to, to the Indo-Pacific, uh, and of course they are moving into the Indo-Pacific and they will do some exercises with Japan when they when they get to the region. So that's the first half of the of the talk. Uh, the second half really um, is about how to understand this, um, what this means, and a little bit more sort of conceptualise this in a little bit more detail. Um, so uh, really, this this is all part of this what we might call defense defense diplomacy, 
Um, and um, looking at the literature, there's some very interesting work here, which, which I sort of dipped into to try and conceptualize what Japan and UK might be doing and where they might converge. So um, it's a rather crude schematic that I've got here, but essentially I think that in terms of literature, you often see uh, what I've got on the, the vertical axis is um, when when uh, when military exercises are talked about, there's there's uh, if you like there's a there's a kind of old old realist style of, of of military exercises that fit into statecraft, where it's really about show of force, um, working with your existing allies and so on. And then more recently, there's a, a, a sort of new style, sort of softer style of of, of of military exercises and cooperation, uh, where you may be working with 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 states that were previously adversaries or non-aligned. Uh, and then in terms of the objectives, um, the literature just talks about pragmatic approaches and transformative. So pragmatic is essentially to, if you like, maintain the existing order and system, but transformative may be to work with new partners in order to transform the broader international system or even to transform the partners uh, themselves. So um, it's some really interesting uh, um, uh, literature. Um, there's you know, a, a wide range of what defense, what are defense diplomacy activities, um, and I've just listed some of them here. But again, uh, naval and maritime exercises form a really, really prominent part of, of thinking about, um, you know, uh, defense diplomacy and, and how it fits within the broader uh, uh, tools of, 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 of statecraft and diplomacy. And military exercises clearly are very, you know, very useful things. Um, because you, they can um, range across the full continuum from more sort of pragmatic cooperation to transformative cooperation. Uh, and of course, they can, they, can, they can range from very initial early contacts, sort of very um, uh, around capacity building and so on, but they can also be ramped up into much into, into forming the sort of bridgehead into much harder military cooperation. So they're a really useful tool of statecraft. Uh, and of course, naval activities are particularly useful uh, for a variety of reasons. So, as I talked about before, naval vessels are sort of symbols and extensions of, of national sovereignty and power. Uh, naval power is very flexible. You can deploy it, you can withdraw it, you can graduate your deployments and so on. It's very visible. Uh, and of course, it's universal because it has, you know, you, you can deploy it, you know, uh, across, across the globe. So it's, it's a tremendously useful tool, tool of statecraft. Um, and you can see from the UK perspective, the UK places, as I said before, a lot of store in defence diplomacy and naval exercises. It, it's always done that during the Cold War. And during the Cold War, I think it practised, you know, the sort of classic old style pragmatic view, uh, pra pra pragmatic defence diplomacy. But since the, since the end of the Cold War, it's moved much more into this new style transformative defence diplomacy for out of region engagement and, and influence. Uh, and there's a lot of emphasis on, on working with new partners. And the Royal Navy has been conceptualized as not just a tool of, 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 so of hard power, but very much as a tool of soft power, as you see from the UK uh, National Security Strategy in 2015. Um, and uh, of course, the UK is moving out of its own region, uh, the Navy anyway, and it's beginning to engage much more in, in the Asia Pacific. And this is just a list of some of the areas where the UK is beginning to cooperate. And then if you turn to the Japanese side, I think Japan has a similar um, you know, um, uh, increased emphasis on what it calls defense cooperation or defense exchange, but essentially it's defense diplomacy. Uh, and Japan, as it merged out of the Cold War, uh, it didn't really do a huge amount of this during the Cold War. It did a little bit of RIMPAC cooperation and so on. It was a little bit old style, but post Cold War, it started to um, in initiate much more of the kind of new style pragmatic defense diplomacy. But I think, um, again, this is debatable, but I, we may debate this, but I think sort of post 2010, 2011, when there was a, a kind of a shift, I think, in the mindset of a lot of uh, Japanese um, policymakers around China, uh, I think Japan has started to shift more to the to the, the sort of old style, realpolitik, realist approach, and a bit more just transformative defense diplomacy in trying to think about actually shaping the international maritime order, uh, and you might even say started to spill over in thinking about the balance of power uh, in in terms in maritime terms. So, uh, of course, th then, we, uh, and so, th again, this is a sort of a list of the, the types of activities that Japan has, has engaged in, all the way from anti-piracy uh, through to now what we're talking about, uh, we talked about earlier on, uh, discussions around the free and, and open Indo-Pacific and shaping the maritime order there. Uh, and UK and Japan have found themselves to be quite good partners in, in some of these efforts. Uh, so the UK and Japan have, have participated in a range of multilateral naval exercises, and also more recently uh, arranged now of UK-Japan 
joint uh, bilateral uh, naval exercises. So you can see the, the cooperation really is ramping up between, between the two states. So I'm on to the final two slides now. Um, so, you know, if we go back to the model, the schemata that I, I, I presented earlier, uh, I hope my graphics are going to work. This is my attempt at uh, animation. Yeah, it does work. Um, so I think the UK kind of started out here, as I said, and I think uh, in sort of Cold War period, and it's moved a bit more into this kind of zone of the new style tr transformative uh, approach to defence diplomacy. I think Japan kind of early post-Cold War started out in this area, and I would argue it's beginning to gravitate a bit more into this kind of zone in terms of thinking about what it, what it can do uh, with um, defence defense exchange and maritime security. And I think the really interesting question is the UK beginning to move from here a bit more to converge with Japan. I think you might argue it is doing it in terms of uh, conducting things like freedom of navigation operations and the kinds of military dispatches uh, to um, the Indo-Pacific region I've talked about. And I think Axel's mentioned it earlier on, the idea that the UK may join the Quad, for instance, in some way and cooperate with the Quad. So uh, the UK is in some ways sort of following the, the Japanese lead or converging with the Japanese position here. Uh, and then just to finish off um, uh, and to sort of uh, use a very bad pun, I mean, I don't think this is all plain sailing, though, uh, in terms of uh, UK-Japan cooperation. Um, there is there is convergence, but also there's, there's still grounds for divergence between the UK and Japan um, uh, more, you know, more broadly in terms of their strategy. They don't always, their interests don't always neatly align with each other. I think there are some real divergences potentially around how to address Russia. Uh, how to address China. I mean, right now, uh, Japan is the best friend for, for the UK in the region, but it was only two or three years ago that China was really the, was seen as the, the future orientation of, 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 of UK interest in Asia. So we'll see how that develops. Uh, and of course, there are some divergent interests around how to approach the EU right now. Uh, I'm not sure the UK is the most reliable uh, actor, um, as we've seen uh, through uh, the way that it's been interacting with the EU. Uh, the way that it has failed to keep its promises around ODA and so on, and how much GDP should be devoted to that. Um, the UK, of course, has limits on its military capacity. Uh, it has two not lovely new aircraft carriers, but essentially once you uh, group all the ships and so on that you need around those aircraft carriers, that's basically the entire Royal Navy uh, in, in those two carrier groups. Uh, and to be able to um, you know, deploy that uh, long term in the region, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, is, is quite an ask. Um, and then I think there are issues on the Japanese side as well. So um, there's a lot about, you know, Japan often talks about, and I think it's been quite masterful in this in getting uh, other countries in a sense to, to, to sort of flood the region with uh, other, uh, its navies uh, in order to sort of create this uh, block on, on trying to create this block on Chinese influence. But Japan's not doing a huge amount outside its region to reciprocate. It does anti-piracy and so on, but essentially it's a very Japanese centered uh, it's Japanese, um, it's around Japanese interests. So how sustainable that is, I don't know. And then of course, Japan has its own, uh, I think domestic problems and issues around leadership, particularly post Abe. I mean, Suga is very committed to these kinds of uh, um, agendas, but uh, he hasn't, you know, how, how, how long lived he will prove in terms of his premiership. Uh, and, and he just clearly doesn't have quite the same cachet uh, internationally as, as, Abe uh, as Abe had. So um, I'll stop there because I think my, my time is up, but um, hopefully that gives us something to talk about. Great, Chris. Thank you very much indeed for situating recent moves in, 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 in the context, uh, particularly this pragmatic transformative. Um, thank you very much indeed. Now we will move to um, Maui's um, uh, discussion, uh, but uh, I think we, I think we, we might better take the uh, floor's question immediately after Maui's uh, uh, questions and comments uh, because we are, you know, a bit of uh, behind. Now, um, uh, so far there is no questions, but for the audience, please use the uh, you know, Q&A functions and please state your name and if there is uh, affiliation and you can uh, make it explicit you know, to whom uh, you're posing the, the questions. Now, 
Um, may I ask Mary to respond, you know, for such a variety of topics from hard military to <laughs> economics, but I'm sure you will handle. Thank you. I need to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, three very interesting topics, very good papers, I'm sure there will be, and you can read them all later on. Uh, but uh, very different topics, as you say, and I will try to initiate the discussion on them, but I don't want to leave outside the audience outside. And I also think inside this group, we can have lots of comments and discussions from the speakers on each other's presentations. I will go with the order uh, the presenters had, and I will start with uh, Axel Berkowski's paper on the Indo-Pacific strategies of EU. Are we uh, a distant player uh, who will not engage? Um, Roland Honekamp definitely said, no, this is not the case. We're much more into Indo-Pacific than before. Uh, and he also claimed economic reasons for why the EU want to be inside Indo-Pacific and have a, a secure Indo-Pacific. I think uh, that is also very important, even if, as Axel say, it's all about China and containing China. There are also economic interests, which I think should be put in place here and which we need to think about when we talk about Indo-Pacific strategies in Europe. Uh, Axel is presenting the French one, the German one and also the EU one and they are of course very different. It shows a lot about Europe, different countries, different backgrounds, different interests like France, who actually have a number of uh, citizens living in Asia, others do not, and so forth. And of course, that will form the way we, we elaborate our Indo-Pacific strategies. Another thing which I was uh, lacking a bit in the paper was actually two other important players in the region, that is US and also Japan. You touch a little bit on Japan, but I think it can be elaborated much more uh, what the role of Japan and the US are in the region. And uh, Europe will, to a certain extent, uh, I think, adjust their strategies depending on what those two big players are doing. Uh, there's a, a huge criticism of Asian centrality and of course uh, Asian is not uh, a defense player, ASEAN is not a defense player in Asia, but I think um, it's a one way of pointing at the regional security. You, you, you bring up ASEAN and what you can do around ASEAN and that is a way of getting away from just China bashing or what others are doing, but try to formulate something of those countries who are not <laughs> China and what they, we can do together in Asia. I also think, and, and uh, we'll come back to this with Chris later on, uh, with the defense diplomacy. Uh, I think economic diplomacy is very important in Asia for Asian players. And there are also broader security aspects than military defense on very, uh, they, these are very important, especially for EU. We've had it up already, but I want to bring it up again. Climate issues, connectivities issues, those are also ways to create peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. So it's not only about showing ships, but I think the European way has always been more on what we can do together in, in, in other areas as well, the broader concept of security, which I think also has been the Japanese one, at least until very recently, where you look at it from a broader perspective than just a, a strictly military one. 
Um, I think I will stop here. And uh, um, of course, there are many, many questions and we will come back to Axel with more from the audience and from the other speakers as well. I want to move on to Patrick and Rickard. Uh, the EPA, the Economic Partnership Agreement, as a model, stepping stone, a way to find acceptance for continued trade liberalization. That's how you portrayed it and how we want it to be. But my question is really, how effective is it? Who cares about uh, EPA between Japan and Europe besides the European countries and Japan itself? Um, we have a strong vantage point uh, of improving the existing rule-based order. Are we able to push that? That's what I was wondering. Are we able to push that? You also showed some very interesting figures about how China now is the biggest trading partner. Uh, I think both for uh, EU and, and for Japan. So this puts certain limitations to how this is going to be pushed, I think. Although, as you state in your paper, a strategic partnership agreement and economic partnership agreements should go hand in hand if we want to achieve something. Uh, there's also this thing with uh, uh, enhancing the idea of uh, connecting EU to wider Asia and the RCEP new free trade agreement. I mean, China is a member of RCEP. So how do we do this? It means uh, that we will have to work much wider than only with Japan or to, uh, um, to try to establish values on a wider range of issues. How do we do it in, in, in reality if we also let the others in? Uh, and how can we keep them out when they are such big partners of ours already today? Uh, economic, I think also this is very important actually, uh, after the COVID-19 that the infrastructure development goes hand in hand with economic recovery, not only infrastructure development, but also connecting digitalization, assisting climate change and so forth. We should do this uh, not only with Japan, but in other places together also. And here a development cooperation could be one tool using to push those things. But again, here China comes in, development cooperation or competition with China. Are we going to assist uh, COVID-19 uh, countries who are in big need of help uh, only from EU and, and Japan, or are we going to connect as well with China? Again, um, where is the US? <laughs> we have to uh, relate to the US. Besides China, uh, we also have to relate the EU-Japan cooperation to the US, I think, even in the field of economics. Green recovery, I think that's a very good area where actually there is cooperation ongoing also with China to a certain extent. Important area, um, EU is, pre but at the same time, EU has some problems here. As uh, Roland Honekamp said, we are pushing Japan to leave coal our cooperation partner this is not an easy thing to do i think it will take it will take some efforts to get japan to leave coal and why is this an, an issue for eu to push of course we push it everywhere in the world but there are other things we could push as well Global production change, uh, chains are also very important and uh, these have been changing during the, during the pandemics. And I think with the digitalization and the changing world we're living in, this is going to change even more. And this is something where EU and Japan should cooperate, how we do it, how we do it more sustainable in the future as well. Yes, finally getting 
some comments on Chris <laughs> presentation. Uh, very interesting and uh, nice to hear something about UK and UK strategy. Uh, we are missing UK, at least here in Sweden, in the press. It seems like UK has disappeared from the scene uh, to a certain extent, if you're not in the UK, of course. And I was wondering uh, what the difference has become for the UK-Japan cooperation once Japan has left the EU. Is UK pressing harder than EU was on cooperation with Japan? Uh, of course, defense is one of UK's areas and where you will be cooperating and have already been cooperating. Many of the figures uh, you showed and the agreements, they were during the EU days concluded there. And will they be more in the future and will UK take a stronger position than what the EU is doing on a general basis uh, concerning the Indo-Pacific and the cooperation with Japan. Strategic convergence um, improving after Brexit, is it? I want to make a question mark there <laughs> if you have any more comments on that. Global Britain uh, looking for new strategic partners. Is uh, Japan is of course one, it's one for EU also. It's not a new partner. Who would be the other new partners for the UK? Softer style, uh, defense diplomacy. Uh, where do we put China in all this? And where I also hear again, I want to get back to the international scene. Where do we have the US in in all this and in in UK strategy towards uh, Asia? And especially now we have three new EU strategies on the Indo-Pacific. Is there any cooperation between the UK strategies and those three European countries who now have their own strategies? Or uh, then the, we get here France, Germany and the EU strategy. Are we cooperating or is UK going its own way all the way through? I think that's a lot of questions to answer. So maybe I leave it here and let others come in as well. Or maybe some answers from the speakers themselves also. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, um, we have had uh, two questions uh, from the floor. Uh, if I may, um, you know, I, I could uh, introduce these two questions and then uh, put back to the uh, three speakers. Is it all right? Okay. Uh, from uh, Ambassador uh, Heinrich Krecht. Krecht, uh, Krecht. Uh, it, it's been a long time not to see you too, but uh, it's great to have you. Um, I think this is to um, Patrick and Richard mainly, but maybe others might want to respond about connectivity. Connectivity between Europe and Asia is a big issue in the context of countering China's BRI. What kind of offer uh, you know, could China, EU, UK and US do together to give countries an alternative to Chinese FDA, trade infra infrastructure and so on. This might um, be something to do with the G7's uh, uh, statement, but anyway, uh, I welcome the response. Also from Dr. Uh, Wilhelm Vosse, I think from um, uh, International Christian University, uh, to Chris, I agree that maritime exercises and joint mission can theoretically lead to some level of transformation. However, do you think the, uh, you know, it has affected security culture in Japan in particular? I am very doubtful. Do you think China will be slight, uh, the slightest way impressed by the UK, German, Dutch, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and German maritime ship visit to the region? Uh, so these are the two precious questions from the floor. And uh, yes, from the, you know, from the, 
the members are from uh, uh, Dr. Um, Midford and the Julio. So, uh, Paul, could you um, speak up first and then Julio? Okay, thank you if, uh, for letting me, although I think Julio put up his hand first, but in uh, any case, I just want to add to something Marie said, and um, in all due respect to the German Foreign Ministry, ASEAN, and, and what Axel said, I, I want to argue that although a Axel is absolutely right that ASEAN is not a military alliance and it's not a counter-China alliance, it is truly central in the uh, multilateral security cooperation and multilateral security dialogues in East Asia, they essentially, and, and the Indo-Pacific, they essentially occupy that entire space. All roads have pretty much led through ASEAN. Um, and um, they have this concept of uh, omni uh, and enmeshment, which means bringing in all the great powers and creating a balance among them. And I think they arguably they've had some real success doing that. And even uh, a lot of forms of concrete security cooperation or less concrete security cooperation we've seen actually are spinoffs of ASEAN. The Quad is a spinoff of the ASEAN Regional Forum. And at least India seems to want to keep it that way, at least in part. Um, for Japan, uh, uh, ASEAN played a role in the ARF in facilitating its leadership in regional counter piracy cooperation through something called RECAP, which is based in Singapore. You have strategic partnerships between Japan now in the Philippines and Vietnam that frankly are aimed at China. Those were really facilitated by the ARF and uh, the defense minister's dialogue through ASEAN as well. And I can tell you that US policymakers see uh, ASEAN as really valuable as a way to talk and engage with China regionally in front of other countries, and frankly, use it to build coalitions to confront China on various issues. So I would not discount the value of ASEAN at all. It's not an alliance. It's not meant to balance against any particular power, but I think it's played a central role. And it's one final thing, China seems to be a little frustrated with ASEAN's convening power, so much so that uh, China has been trying to establish an alternative regional security dialogue that frankly has not really gotten off the ground. So um, I, I think the German foreign ministry may be onto something, not an alliance, but a very central actor in regional security. Thank you. Julio? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to add on uh, Paul very briefly, it is interesting that <clears throat> uh, the Japanese government, at least rhetorically, um, also emphasizes ASEAN centrality very often so <clears throat> and then that's uh, that, that is to add really to Paul's comment but my question is for Axel and, and Chris and is related to Marie's uh, emphasis on the US and I would like to know as well what kind of role does the US uh, in having uh, a more engaged uh, uh, French, German, European slash UK navies in, in the region, because it's not just Japan, <clears throat> of course, or their own interests, but there are clearly there are signs that the US is also behind the picture. And then there is a question for, for Chris, really, which is something that I've been uh, uh, thinking about for, for, for a while. My sense is that the UK is also trying to leverage its own security um, uh, its own security excellencies and 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 and, and engagement uh, for uh, um, the purpose of, of uh, uh, signing uh, trade agreements, and so there is a linkage there, which I see as very interesting there, and and this which is connected with your perfidious Albion uh, uh, comment in a sense, because it might not be sustainable once uh, the UK joins CPTPP, then it's. It's time to basically tilt on the China side, perhaps. But I would like to know what you think. Thanks. Great. Yes, we have exactly 50 minutes left. Um, I would like to ask the three speakers to respond to the, you know, first question. Oh, well, you can rearrange those questions. Uh, you know. Uh, questions from Marie first, and then, uh, you know, the connectivity and maritime exercises, ASEAN, US, and so on. Um, so in order of speaking, uh, Alex, uh, uh, for five minutes, is it fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give back some time now. Okay, thank you for, thank you for all your comments and questions. And uh, coming to Paul, yes, of course, I, I do agree. 
with Paul that ASEAN per se is, is central, you know, is a, is a good forum. And, is, and what I said earlier, I don't want to dismiss ASEAN, um, you know, as a forum, you know, and then a forum to talk to each other as opposed to talk to about each other. However, uh, as a, you know, and here I'm the policy analyst saying, you know, you know as regards the uh, security the issues on the ground. Okay, it's my favorite topic. Go to the South China Sea. ASEAN has not been doing any, any, any uh, ASEAN has not produced any results. Yes, I agree. It's not le it's not a legally binding institution. Not defense alliance is not supposed to produce um, these these sorts of um, your know, concrete results telling China not to build you know military base on 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 the Spratly Islands. Uh, fair enough. Uh, but also, and of course you know this Paul because you know this Paul because you you always know all the details. You know, China has been using ASEAN also, and when, when Cambodia was a few years ago holding the ASEAN chairmanship from keeping ASEAN from expressing any opinion whatsoever on the South China Sea. You know, uh, it works both ways. You know, in, in a way, um, it's not resolving um, China, so it seems, at least sometimes, that's, you know, real politic, uh, it's fair game, if you will, is using ASEAN also to, to keep uh, such, uh, such discussions on the, to put it bluntly. Um, Willem Fosse, hi Willem, nice to, nice to talk to you again, if I may very briefly. Um, is China going to be impressed by all of this? Uh, the Europeans into the, into the Indi, in the Pacific, the French uh, teaming up with the Quad, the, the Brits teaming up with the Quad. Uh, who knows, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what Paul and Chris have to say on this. I mean, it depends on what, what they will be doing. What I also raised at the beginning of my paper, you know, will it be looking from a distance, uh, you know, what China is doing and, you know, publishing, issuing satellite pictures, you know, pointing to what, what China is doing, or is it going to be something else you know and uh, and i think you know china is a realist power and i you know i'm certainly you know i wouldn't call myself a china basher but you know but you know marie was onto something certainly but it depends on on what um uh, what 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 they will be doing together you know individually jointly and together in the quad and then we'll see whether china will be impressed you know uh, you know sea blockade i don't know you know whether this is possible this is feasible it's certainly an aggressive move which will you know lead to uh, uh to, to response in kind but you know it depends on what they will be doing and then we'll see uh i don't know what the others thing whether china will be impressed uh, so it doesn't seem to be impressed because uh, you know what china is doing is is uh, you know china's not changing in fact every time the european the Americans voice something about Chinese territorial expansionism. You know, uh, China is speeding up uh, the construction of, uh, of civilian and military facilities. You know, uh, Julio, yes, good point. The U.S. In fact, I talk a little bit about the U.S. in my paper, and then you probably have to uh, have to uh, elaborate a bit more on this. And also, Marie uh, was um, was uh, was 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 mentioning this. Um, you know, the French. If you look at the French uh, in the Pacific policy paper in detail, there is a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, convergence with 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 how the uh, well the uh, the Pentagon specific paper. There's a lot of cooperation around, and 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 was uh, is calling itself a balancing power. You know, we're leaning towards the U.S. Uh, being part of a of a of an offshore uh, alliance against uh, against uh, you know whom. So you know, if you look at the and and the detailed paper. Don't have time to do it now. Um, it is certainly compatible with it, compatible, much more compatible, uh, at least on paper, you know. And of course, Paul has a point. Who knows what, uh, you know, you know how how the German paper will, will materialize then on the ground. But on paper, I think uh, there's there's a lot of room for compatible uh, approaches and 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 on on the ground cooperation between the U.S. and uh, and and and, uh, and the Europeans. Uh, that's it, Ken, for me. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks for keeping time too. Thank you. Now the um, so Patrick, uh, are you going to respond? Or Rick, yeah, maybe you want to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's uh, maybe time for me to air my voice here in this uh, congregation okay. here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, also for all the presenters and uh, the interesting insights uh, that was raised. Um, and uh, I, I, it was a lot, a lot of kind of related question. Maybe it's kind of a mesh of uh, different uh, subject areas here. But uh, we can uh, start with uh, what Marie asked about the efficiency of EPA itself. Um, it's a very good question, of course, and still it's uh, too early to get kind of hands-on statistics on this kind of uh, economic uh, effects in the terms of uh, trade volumes. Uh, especially what uh, I personally look forward to is um, 
uh, what kind of effects it has for uh, especially intermediate uh, goods uh, that is uh, what is sent as a kind of uh, you know uh, input uh, goods to uh, the industries especially in Europe of course uh, for Japan as we all know uh, automobile industry part of this uh, EPA is of the greatest concern when it comes to uh, non uh, uh, abolishing uh, all tariffs really uh, also another uh, matter of fact that we have I think about uh, 95 to 99 percent of all tariffs is basically abolished uh, more or less immediately now uh, other uh, the few uh, items have been uh, phased out over a long period of time but still uh, it is uh, something that uh, of course we need to assess in the coming years but uh, having said this, of course, we have seen some immediate effect, as Patrick uh, well put it in his presentation, especially in council, like maybe, of course, a minor uh, uh, areas, but it's still like uh, agriculture and so on. And I think everyone of us uh, living in Europe and uh, fancy Japanese uh, agricultural products uh, already have uh, noticed is a great influx of uh, Japanese uh, 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 sake and uh, whiskey and uh, food stuff and so on but uh, when it comes to like the real value like a uh, significant value of uh, the uh, intermediate goods is something that we need to uh, put uh, on uh, attention in the coming years uh, when it comes to digitization and maybe this also taps into what uh, one of uh, the audience uh, questions uh, from uh, uh, Harry Kreft uh, about connectivity and digitalization is definitely something that uh, is um, uh, on the top agenda, I think, is for a major concern for Europe and the European Commission in particular at the moment as we speak. But um, uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, needs to be put in relation to security policy here. Maybe I relate to what uh, Chris and uh, Axel might uh, be uh, adding here. But uh, we have to remember that even though, of course, uh, China is the uh, greatest trading partners, both for European Union and Japan at the moment, uh, we have uh, certain uh, factors. Is one, one is, of course, uh, the Industry 4.0, as our German friends is well aware of, uh, is uh, something that might change the board game uh, uh, of international trade in the future. Uh, maybe it's too early to put in a kind of significant uh, what do you say weight on uh, what how important is that might uh, change the international uh, trade order but still loss of production already as uh, we speak now is possible to do at uh, reasonable uh, cost efficiency in europe as uh, you could do it in china uh, so uh, in the connection with uh, uh, green economy concerns for security and so on and uh, also as you all know what happens in the Suez Canal with uh, uh, you know uh, uh, ever given uh, debacle and also the current uh, outbreak of virus in Guangzhou in uh, southern China that uh, delays the international trade up to I think uh, 16 days as compared to half day as it was before this uh, local uh, outbreak this reality that we all have to live with in the future covid is not uh, also disappearing it will be recurring uh, outbreaks is uh, what experts is uh, suggesting meaning that uh, the shipping uh, logistics is not as stable maybe in the future as it has been so far meaning that it is a, a sense of uh, what to say uh, what say logic of reshoring increasingly from china back to japan or uh, europe for at least some parts of the industries. So uh, all in all, uh, the second point I want to also may I was about to forget is that the European uh, loss of European uh, Union countries are members of AIB, which is a vehicle of financing the Belt and Road Initiative of China, meaning that we all also have a direct insight, at least uh, hopefully in the Asian uh, Investment uh, Infrastructure Bank uh, uh, in uh, Beijing. So is this nothing that BRI is not really something that keeps on going without any kind of knowledge out of uh, European actors, for example? Japan is not uh, still a member of AIB, uh, 
uh, is there some political discussions ongoing on that. But uh, as you see, it's all in all uh, to, uh, you know, in the interest of time, uh, to make it uh, more brief, is that it is hard, of course, to uh, separate economic interests, uh, both for uh, EU, Japan, and also the big actors, uh, China uh, and the US, and the security issues that is also important, because we are talking a lot, uh, as uh, uh, Axel well put it, in the, uh, in, uh, uh, the uh, freedom of... Uh, uh, shipping in uh, South China Sea and so on, which is important trade link also uh, in terms of not only BRI but also uh, between direct uh, shipping links between uh, EU and Japan and so on. So w we need to have a kind of concerns and attention to what's happening in kind of more holistic way as we try to, I think, uh, reflect here in this particular session. So I hope that I had type to address some of at least the issues, maybe not everything here, but uh, it's my response to the comments. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, maybe quickly moving to Chris, please. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, so uh, Marie's comments, thank you very much. Um, has the UK disappeared? You feel the UK has disappeared from the scene? Well, we're sort of sitting on our island here in splendid isolation. Um, I mean, COVID hasn't helped, but um, certainly we, you know, the UK is doing its very best job to pretend it's not, it's got nothing to do, well, the government anyway, is doing its best to pretend that it's not, it's, it's got nothing to do with Europe anymore. Uh, and it's a global Britain and so on. So that partly reflects that. Um, what's the difference for the UK, Japan cooperation sort of, you know, post Brexit compared to pre Brexit is, is UK trying harder? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, um, it, it, it Brexit has kind of speeded up. A lot of that was already happening, um, and, and especially when we had, you know, you know post-referendum as well, that, that kind of quickened the pace. But when Brexit actually happened, I mean, I think the UK government really did have to prove there was some substance to the whole idea of uh, global Britain. Um, and there will be more on defence cooperation, I think, and I'll say a bit more about that when I respond to, to, to Wilhelm. Um, but, uh, and, and also to sort of respond to you, but also I think respond to Julio's question, um, you know where will the UK push really hard? I think I think it is on this. It it, it is trying to leverage some of this uh, cooperation with Japan, some of this um, you know evidence that the UK is a player, uh, you know in in, in the Indo-Pacific region to try and get um, you know better better trade position. Um, so obviously it's it's already has a you know, trade deal with 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 Japan, which isn't much different from what it had when it was in the EU, but it's kind of rolled over that situation. But but the real goal is to get into CPTPP. And the UK is in, in, in talks about that, um, you know, and the UK is kind of very keen you know, because they feel there's, there's massive opportunity there in, in services and so on. Um, and it's a kind of different kind of trade deal. You know, it's kind of doesn't have all the, comp, you know, from the UK perspective, at least the Brexiteers you know, perspective, it doesn't have all the uh, comp entanglements of the single market and all the stuff that goes with it. So it's a kind of socially distanced FTA, uh, which the sort of UK sort of government quite, quite likes. Um, you know, but of course, there's a paradox there because actually, you know, the UK can only accede to the uh, CPTPP. It can't negotiate its way in. So actually, it's becoming a rule taker rather than, you know, so the, it's the whole kind of paradox of, of, of Brexit. Global Britain, who are the new partners? Um, it's hard to say. China was supposed to be one, but that's, you know, that's been, that's, that's, off, the, that's off the, you know, um, I don't think the UK wants a confrontational relationship with China, but that's kind of off the, off the table for the moment. Um, actually, there's a lot of romanticism about the old Commonwealth and the old Anglosphere, and it's it's not so new. It's about sort of recreating, or sort of re, re um, you know, sort of re reviving those old those old relationships. So it's Australia, India, Commonwealth countries, etc. You know, maybe Africa, may, maybe Latin America, anybody that you know, anybody really. Um, but also the the new emphasis is very much on the sort of democracies. So you saw the G7, you saw this kind of idea of the D11, I think it was, you know, bringing in South Korea as well and so on. So um, that, that, that's the sort of, that's the, that's the sort of global Britain idea anyway. So you cut all these new kind of deals free. You've got, this, you've got freedom now to do whatever you want and play with whoever you like and you're not tied down to the, to the, uh, to the slow old EU. Where's the US? I mean, again, UK, like everybody is very, very well, you know, very welcoming of the Biden administration because, you know, it's much easier to, to deal with um uh, and of course you know the uk would love to, to i think you know 
very close to US ally. They could, I think it believes it can do a lot, you know, in terms of military cooperation in the Indo Pacific, and maybe then the Quad uh, is, 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 is a way in. And of course, in the G7, we saw this kind of new Atlantic Charter or something signed between Johnson and Biden. I don't really know what was in it, but, you know, it's all this kind of, all this kind of, you know, um, kind of rhetoric again, sort of, you know, post sort of World War II, sort of, you know, post war planning sort of rhetoric. So, so, you know, the US will always feature incredibly closely in, uh, in, in UK sort of idea of, of, of global Britain. Is it coordinated with the EU? I don't really know. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things is that I think when the, when the, when the aircraft carrier gets there, I think it would do some exercises with the Netherlands. I think, I think the Netherlands is actually maybe accompanying it as a destroyer. So there's some kind of coordination, but I don't know. Uh, Willem's question, um, uh, you know, is, is the UK going to influence Japanese security behavior? That's a really big question. Um, I think to some degree. I mean, I think I think we are seeing more integration. Um, you know, UK and Japan got AXA. There's lots of defence industrial cooperation, cooperation on cyber, which you know much more about. Uh, talking about cooperation in in space, and I think there could be you know the really big thing could be intelligence as well. If you know, if Japan was actually to take the plunge and try and, and was allowed to join the Five Eyes, then that would be a massive, I think, change in terms of integration of of, of Japanese security uh, with you know a broader set of, of 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 players will china be impressed don't know um i mean i don't think the idea is the uk is trying to sort of you know overtly deter china i think some of it's around just reassuring japan that japan has friends and so on um so it's around sort of you know showing presence i don't think the uk wants to get into a, a fight uh, with china uh you know that would be i think the aircraft carrier would be sunk pretty quick so that'll be you know 20 billion pounds worth of stuff going in the bottom of the ocean um but what it does do, I think what it does do for China is just complicate things. As I said before, the fact that all these sort of like minded, you know, rules based international order sort of favoring states are all just flooding into the Indo Pacific uh, and they're all talking the same language. I think from the Chinese perspective, it just makes things so much more complex and difficult to operate and throw its weight around. I mean, ultimately it can, and ultimately the backstop is the United States and it's about hard, those hard alliances. But it, but it really makes it difficult for, for China, I think. And, and I think, I don't really know, but I think China's irritated. So it's, it's, ra it's ratcheting up the rhetoric. So it's taking some notice, uh, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna fundamentally, you know, the UK sailing an aircraft carrier there is not gonna fundamentally change the balance of power. I'll stop there. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, we have more or less exhausted our time, but uh, you know, I, I certainly don't have any capacity to summarize such rich arguments uh, going on here. Uh, just there's a very small point. The, um, I was intrigued by the ASEAN centrality. I always agreed to, I and mean, then this is an important organization, but the, the, the ASEAN centralization, cent, uh, you know, centrality may have some hole in it. You know, I just overheard from Japanese diplomat that uh, the ASEAN's, uh, you know, the community statement, the summit statement always is seen by Beijing through, you know, uh, you know, Phnom Penh, Kampuchea. It's always leaked one day before, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you know, China is quite uh, capable of, uh, you know, uh, manipulating this divide and rule type of things. Now, um, sorry, if I may abuse the uh, competence of the chair, um, may I pose very small questions to the uh, uh, Patrick or, or Richard? Um, because you, you know, uh, today we haven't discussed the um, economic coercive diplomacy type of things. You know, I we all agree to the the observation that the economy and security are being marched. Uh, and then it is here that the uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, um, uh, issues uh, these days, uh, 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 you know, they are uh, coming up. Uh, I just wonder on the European side, uh, you know, for instance, in Sweden, is there any policy idea uh, put forward to, you know, to run counter or, you know, uh, to mitigate uh, the, the, the damage inflicted uh, by this economic coercive type of diplomacy. Uh, you know, I, I may have another, but uh, it's running out of time. So may I put just one, one question to either of you? Uh, it's a very 
difficult question that you uh, pose. Uh, I'm not really sure if I can answer that. Uh, at least maybe party can uh, do that. Uh, but um, uh, I think uh, it's not really something that I have seen publicly on the agenda. Uh, we do have, uh, uh, what is interesting is well, uh, when it comes to, especially to EU Japan uh, um, uh, EPA is the level of transparency that has been uh, from very first beginning is uh, also one of the uh, actually uh, initiatives or uh, what you say insistence by the former trade commissioner uh, Cecilia Malmström as you know uh, she's Swedish uh, uh, national uh, and uh, in a various uh, was a round of discussion we had uh, both personally uh, with uh, me and my uh, colleagues in Gothenburg uh, but uh, also in a public species that uh, she has uh, been very concerned about uh, being a, a trade agreement that is not shadowed, shadowed in a kind of secrecy or a kind of opaque uh, diplomatic way. But uh, so uh, those interesting can go to uh, DG Trade uh, homepage and see all notes kind of very publicly and it has been published very immediately after uh, agreement with Japan so in that sense uh, if that is some kind of answer to your uh, question can but uh, I'm not really sure but uh, it is uh, one way to uh, at least uh, for a symbolic uh, factor of uh, make it is kind of a clear uh, message and also if i may be on the uh, conspir uh, conspiratorical <laughs> uh, side is uh, that also if you get uh, information uh, or kind of correct information out uh, more or less immediately then it's less of a discussion to question like parts of uh, for example epa um, agreement and so on but having said this, of course, I don't believe that any of these kind of security related, like a security partnership agreement uh, deal and so on will be public in that uh, similar uh, or transparent in a similar level. But uh, it yeah, may, maybe can be seen as a kind of symbolic act, uh, at least the workings around EPA. Just a quick comment, I think, from the, specifically from the Swedish side, one example is, of course, to work with the EU, of course, with the, with the competences there, but also getting involved with the uh, AIIB, for instance, uh, on, on the more uh, individual uh, membership level. So that, that's one example of how you're trying to kind of move in different areas, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, I have... Um, overused my time and competence as a chair. I just uh, ask this uh, because I found the uh, G7 statement weakest in this regard. But anyway, it's great to have your reaction. Um, we have more than 60 minutes to go, but I just return to uh, Julio or Marie uh, for just you know, arrange the time. Is it as as we plan? We go as 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 we planned, or well, we have a break. Uh, we have a short break, and um, I think that the original plan was to uh, ten thirty. Yeah, ten thirty. So, is ten thirty okay for everybody? Just five minutes. Uh, yeah, you know, five yes, minute but, uh, break. But before that, I would like to thank the three speakers and, and commentator, as well as uh, Mia, who organized this, uh, helped to organize this conference. Thank you very much indeed for all of you. Thank you. Wonderful. So it is 10.33. I hope you all had a very nice and relaxing break and could get some uh, beverage, some drink um, in, on this hot summer day. I'm very happy to welcome you all 
back here to the second uh, panel in our session this morning. My name is Verena blechinger talcott I'm a professor of Japanese politics and political economy at Berlin Free University. And I am uh, very pleased uh, to chair this uh, second panel this morning. Um, the second panel will address um, issues of EU-Japan uh, cooperation in specific policy fields, as well as in uh, specific parts of um, the uh, East Asian uh, and uh, Southeast Asian region. And I'm quite happy to welcome um, our three speakers. We will have uh, three inputs of about 10 to 15 minutes each. Our first speaker will be Paul Mitford, who uh, is a professor of international relations at Meiji Gakuin University in Yokohama, Japan. That's also where he joins us from. Um, Paul is also a member of the EJARN Executive Committee. He specializes in Japanese foreign and security policies and East Asian regional politics and security. And you may know his work on um, especially Japanese security, uh, East Asian uh, security multilateralism and Japan's role in it, as well as uh, public opinion and security in Japan. But uh, before he uh, joined Meiji Gakuin University, for many years. He was also a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. And that's where he also developed this interest in renewable energies. And that's something he will talk about uh, today in our panel. Our second uh, speaker will then be Marco Zappa. He's assistant professor in Japanese studies at Kafoskari University. Um, Marco is interested in uh, critical international relations theory, sociology of knowledge, but especially also in Japan Southeast Asian relate relations and um, also public policy analysis. So he will um, speak about Japan Southeast Asia um, in, in his talk and um, more uh, clearly on uh, EU Japan uh, cooperation in Vietnam. And then while we are staying in the East Asian region, um, we will um, have a third paper on our panel this morning by um, Professor Atsuko Higashino. She comes from Tsukuba University, where she's a senior lecturer at the Graduate School of um, Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, uh, Professor Higashino has been, um, has, has got her PhD and uh, her MA at the University of Birmingham in the UK um, and has been teaching um, in uh, Tsukuba for quite some time, has also published quite extensively on Japan um, and on EU, Japan-EU relations, as well as cooperation in the region. And this is also the topic of her paper today, the EU-China-Taiwan relationship as seen from a Japanese perspective. So we will have a broad range of topics, but also very nicely focus on EU-Japan collaboration. And our discussant today is Professor Iwa Mayoko, who comes to us from the Graduate Institute for Policy Studies Grips uh, in Tokyo. Um, and uh, Professor Iwama is the director of the Strategic Studies Program and also the director of the Maritime Safety and Security Policy Program, as well as the director of Security and International Studies Program at GRIPS. Um, she has a, a vast experience in uh, working in academia and also uh, in relation to um, uh, policy and policy consulting. Um, and um, so in that way, we are very honored to have her as a discussant for this panel. Now I will stop talking because you're here to listen to the papers and I hand over right uh, to Paul Mitford, who will give his input on uh, Japan EU uh, cooperation in renewable energy. Paul, please. Uh, well, Verena, thank you for that very kind introduction. And again, thanks to Julio and Marie and to all the organizers um, for organizing this seminar today. Um, so as she was saying, I um, have developed an interest in the last couple of years in uh, renewable energy, uh, somewhat also in environmental issues, but particularly in renewable energy. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. As you can see, EU-Japan cooperation in this field, um, as is the story of my life, kind of too many slides, not enough time, but hopefully I'll be able to, um, uh, I will do my best to stay with very much within time. I might, I may skip over some slides is not quite as central. So what I wanna talk about today is the uh, global renewable energy revolution. 
uh, what it is and what it isn't uh, briefly, and then talk about EU and Japan as leaders in combating global warming and promoting renewable energy in various ways. Uh, and the need for strategic cooperation and coordination among the, uh, these two partners and the most promising areas for that cooperation. Um, so let's see here. Um, so um, I want to start by talking about this global energy revolution. Um, we're in the midst of uh, a, a, an energy shift, if not in fact a global energy revolution. Now this is based on technology that was developed between 1970 and, and 2010. And, and, and one point I wanna make here is that often when we hear discussions about renewable energy, it's talked about in the context of, uh, you know, emerging technologies, new technologies, uh, technological revolution that will change things from now. But I'd like to emphasize that actually the technology is pretty much developed. It was mostly developed between 1970 and 2010 in a variety of areas. Now, some areas it's more developed than others, uh, wind turbines, solar panel, photovoltaic solar, solar panels, very well developed. Um, somewhat more recently, uh, lithium ion and other storage batteries, uh, but still that's now an established technology. Hydrogen is an area where hydrogen related technology where we're seeing some more technological dyna dynamism, but mostly in all of these areas, we're looking at commercialization of existing technologies, incremental improvements over year over, over time to increase efficiency and output. Um, but basically we're, they're building on established technology. So this is not, we're not talking about a technological revolution here. We're talking about the deployment and development and scaling up of existing technologies. Now, global investment in renewable energy generation assets has already overtaken the combined uh, new investment in fossil fuel and nuclear fueled power electricity generation by far. And you can see the statistics on my screen. I won't read them. Um, and uh, But I will uh, emphasize that this is, this is in part driven by rapidly falling costs. So the unsubsidized levelized cost of uh, utility scale solar PV projects, you can see here over the, uh, uh, or more than 10 years, uh, previously, 2009 to 2019, has fallen by 89%. Uh, wind power, the cost of uh, wind power has fallen 70% during the same period. And between, uh, let's see here, and just in the last few years, 2018 and 2020, we've seen a dramatic fall in uh, the, the cost of storage batteries. They fall, fell nearly 50% between just 2018 and 2020. And uh, as I'll get to later, storage is a key technology or a key uh, asset that has to be invested in, uh, in order for renewable energy, particularly variable solar and wind that uh, is not constant. It's not a base source of power. It varies as the wind uh, rises and falls and as the sun uh, rises and sets. Um, uh, but the key point here is that these technologies have been developed, they're here, they're becoming increasingly inexpensive, and consequently, in many parts of the world now, wind and uh, solar power are as cheap or even cheaper than renewable, than uh, fossil fuels. Everywhere, they're arguably much cheaper than nuclear power, but uh, they're already uh, uh, cheaper in many places, cheaper even than coal oil, natural gas. That's not quite true. The case, uh, that's not quite the case in Japan. Coal has been cheap, remains cheaper in Japan, but that's mostly due to regulatory issues and issues regarding uh, construction and uh, related issues. The costs of solar panels uh, per, or um, uh, wind turbines per se uh, are quite competitive in Japan as they are elsewhere in the world. Now, um, uh, re uh, in terms of, I just want to say br briefly looking at EU targets for um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, first point is that renewable energy is the key means uh, or one of the most important means for achieving decarbonization and getting to uh, zero uh, uh, carbon neutrality. Um, emissions uh, uh, neutrality. So EU gre greenhouse, sorry, gas emissions uh, reduction targets for tw uh, for uh, 2020 already achieved, basically. The key targets here I want to emphasize are 2030, uh, where they're calling for a 55% cut in GHG, which is up from the previous target of 40%. And then by 2050, they've raised the target from 80% to net zero emissions by 2050. 
Um, and in terms of renewable energy, uh, they've raised the target for 2030 from 32 percent up to 38 to 40 percent. They're also calling for a 15 percent uh, expansion of national grid interconnectivity, so connecting national grids. That's important for renewable energy because because it's a variable source, you need to expand the size of the grid. Um, also, they're promoting short-term regional international markets for power uh, 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 markets for, for electricity buying and selling uh, uh, instantaneously or one day ahead. Uh, Japan's emission targets and policies. Japan, we've also seen Japan upping its game. Uh, it had previously had a target of 26% of uh, GHG reductions by 2030. Uh, Suga raised that uh, just in April to 46%. And uh, in, he announced last fall that Japan would um, raise its target from 80% to 100% reductions in GHG by 20, uh, sorry, by, by 2050. Uh, and this also assumes that nearly 100% of Elect, uh, electric passenger of uh, passenger vehicles will be electrified by then, and there's a move uh, proposal to stop all petrol car sales in Japan by 2040. Um, and now Japan has had a relatively low renewable energy target, 22 to 24 percent. Now, but uh, in the new basic energy plan that's coming out soon, that should be raised up to 38 percent. Uh, and along with that, and this was talked about this morning, uh, the, the uh, outlook is that the share of coal uh, in Japanese electricity production is now scheduled to be slashed. So that means shutting down all the plans for new coal plants and beginning to shut down some of the older coal plants. Coal will not be eliminated by 2030, but it will be reduced compared to what it is now. That is what the new basic energy plan uh, uh, appears uh, to be the outlook for that. This is something actually that wasn't in my paper that I've just added a bit more recently. Um, the Abe administration was relatively passive on its uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets and on renewable energy, although they began to become more uh, proactive towards renewable energy when they came to see it as a, a wave, uh, as a uh, form of disaster preparedness. Now, Suga has been much more proactive and um, ambitious. In part, I think he's trying to use uh, renewable energy and, and global uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, leadership as a way to justify uh, a new term for him as prime minister. Um, and, uh, this also reflects uh, pressure from Japanese industry, which is seeing multinationals like Apple and Microsoft say they will no longer source from companies that rely, that do not use 100% renewable energy by 2030. Uh, this is also backed by a, an intra-cabinet coalition of Konotaro and Koizumi uh, Shinjiro, and they have succeeded in, uh, they played a big role in, in boosting the share of uh, renewable energy that should be in the next uh, basic energy plan. They also have removed references in an a, uh, economic planning document to reliance on nuclear power as a base um, energy source, and they've been promoting the sc uh, scrapping of uh, coal expansion plans. Uh, and coal has really been a flashpoint up to now, but uh, it appears that um, that uh, uh, is now, we're mo now moving past that. And, um, and I might also mention that Kono is a leading candidate to be the next prime minister of Japan, and he's a very uh, strong advocate of renewable energy and opponent of nuclear power. Um, now, I want to emphasize that the EU and Japan really have to balance cooper cooperating with front runner China. And we have to recognize China is now the leader in many, if not most, renewable energy and uh, uh, clean uh, energy technologies, including uh, electric vehicles, increasingly so on batteries, already for a long time in, in terms of PV solar. They have to balance cooperation with China for the sake of, of uh, reducing uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to maintaining and developing their own autonomy and competitiveness in this area, in these areas, and not sort of letting China become totally dominant such that their own uh, industries uh, are no longer viable. So the key areas we have to focus on are smart grids, large scale batteries, storage batteries, um, also for electric vehicles like the one I just bought, uh, and hydrogen related technologies. I'm briefly going to go over these. Um, uh, this is where I'm going to kind of skip, just say that Japan and uh, the EU have launched cooperation in terms of energy uh, cooperation already back in 1987, and the strategic partnership agreement between them on energy uh, talks about cooperation in terms of um, 
renewable energy or energy efficiency um, and talks about um, uh, you know various forms of collaboration. Now, you've had an EU-Japan dialogue specifically on renewable energy since 2007. Uh, and uh, at the uh, and also you've had the uh, raising of the EU Japan uh, bilateral dialogue on energy was raised to the ministerial level for the first time in 2012. They've started they've been discussing joint R and D on PV solar and electricity storage technology. Although again, this is really just refining existing technology, not uh, creating some kind of industrial or uh, technological leap forward. Uh, also, there have been a lot of uh, exchanging of experience and discussions about liberalizing electricity markets where Europe moved first and then Japan followed, and also the development of smart grids. Um, the uh, EU-Japan Sustainable Connectivity Partnership from September 2019 that was discussed uh, calls for both sides to promote uh, hydrogen uh, uh, and hydrogen fuel cell cooperation, electricity market regulation, deregulation, support for sustainable energy connectivity uh, by building on this existing dialogue and promoting these technologies and clean energy in third countries, uh, in, uh, in, in, yeah, in third countries, developing countries in particular. Now, Japan can benefit from the European experience with grid and electricity market reform. Um, Japan has really uh, big challenges in terms of building a national uh, electricity grid and also uh, building interconnections with other countries. Co South Korea's uh, proposed an interconnection, also proposals for interconnections with China, Russia, etc. None of that has happened yet. You have extensive undersea cable connections in Europe. I might just mention the Norwegian uh, UK uh, cable that's being built that is uh, going to be the longest undersea uh, power connection cable over 700 kilometers. Um, also, Japan has followed uh, the Nordic region in terms of establishing a grid regulator to promote and kind of push the regional monopolies to uh, uh, expand their tie lines so that uh, more renewable energy can be accepted onto the grid. I'll just briefly uh, show this. This shows some of the real challenges Japan has in terms of uh, building a national grid, including the fact it doesn't even have one unified power source. You have 50 versus 50 uh, hertz in Western Japan, 60 hertz in Japan. In Eastern Japan, they have to convert them. So that's a big challenge Japan faces. Um, smart grids, including smart meters, um, can help promote renewable energy by allowing demand management to mitigate fluctuations in production. So basically, demand can be uh, adjusted to um, uh, match with supply. Um, that's the, the basic idea of smart grids in this case. Um, and it can also make it easier for homeowners to sell electricity produced from their rooftop solar uh, 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 panels. Now, one challenge is that China holds a large percentage of the smart meter market. Um, and this is important for Japan also because it has, again, a very inflexible grid, which means it's been emphasizing base load power sources like fossil fuels and nuclear power and making a more flexible grid will allow Japan to reduce its base load targets. Uh, Japan can learn from the European uh, Electricity Grid Initiative and the EU can benefit from cooperating with Japan in terms of uh, technology. So many smart grid patents in recent years have been from Japan. Uh, finally, Japan's long-term leadership in the hydrogen economy, uh, which Japan has been promoting since 1974 and particularly since the 1981 Moonlight uh, project. Um, and particular highlight here in March 2014, Japan announced, uh, announced its hydrogen strategy, really the world's first national hydrogen strategy that called for building a hydrogen society by 2050. Um, and Japan has shown consistent leadership in this area. This is one area where Japan still maintains a clear lead over China is in the hydrogen economy. Uh, and uh, I won't spend too much time about this, but hydrogen is a carrier and storage uh, medium for electricity, and it can be produced from renewable energy, from surplus wind power, surplus solar energy, and thereby reduce the amount of energy that has to be curtailed. Um, and it can be used to produce electricity. One problem is that the whole cycle from producing hydrogen and oxygen from water to then converting it back into electricity and water via fuel cell is still only about 50% uh, efficiency. So there's need to uh, incrementally increase that. 
You have any farms as well, which kind of produces hydrogen from reformed natural gas, although you have the issue of the carbon that's a byproduct of that, that's a, a potential issue. Um, Japan has been the leader in terms of producing the first fuel cell cars that are commercially mass produced and mass sold, although their market remain, share remains small. Uh, battery powered uh, electric vehicles have grown much more rapidly than hydrogen to date. Um, so Japan is trying to make hydrogen a mass source uh, or carrier for fuel. Uh, Japan is promoting the 2020 Olympics next month as the hydrogen Olympics. The Olympic Village will be powered by fuel cells. The buses carrying athletes will be higher, uh, uh, powered by fuel cells. And former governor of Tokyo talked about the Tokyo Olympics uh, for 2020 being the hydrogen Olympics, just like the 64 Olympics were the bullet train or Shinkansen Olympics or uh, Olympics. Um, and Japan opened the world's largest uh, hydrogen plant powered 100% by renewable energy in Fukushima uh, in 2020. Um, so that's an example of their leadership in, in, uh, in that area. Um, and this, again, it reduces the curtailment problem, allows uh, renewable energy to be more fully utilized. And uh, Japan hopes to have larger industrial scale renewable uh, energy uh, hydrogen plant, so-called green hydrogen by 2030, uh, and have a, 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 an end subsidies and have a fully sustaining hydrogen economy by 2050. So far, there's been remarkably little cooperation with the EU and Japan in this area. Uh, there's a lot of the, uh, it's beginning to come into the dialogues that's uh, on, on energy. There's some discussion of hydrogen, but there could be a lot more. Um, that's surprising given that you already have an, a Sino-Japanese hydrogen seminar and fairly significant cooperation, though you do have a Japan-Norway hydrogen uh, seminar as well. Um, the EU, which is now, uh, did last year announce its own hydrogen strategy through its European Green uh, Deal, could learn from uh, Japan by uh, further elaborating its own strategy. The European strategy is very nascent and underdeveloped. Um, there's also a trade potential. So for example, renewable energy produced in Iceland or Northern Scandinavia could be shipped to Japan as hydrogen. Um, and in fact, that's already happening. Norway is already exporting hydrogen to Japan from uh, its hydroelectric dams. So my final slide um, is that, um, <clears throat> or final, uh, yeah, my, my final slide are these policy recommendations, namely that, uh, uh, the two sides should establish an, a hydrogen dialogue. Uh, they should coordinate their hydrogen strategies. They should establish um, uh, also a dialogue on sustainable connectivity to focus on how to, prom how to promote uh, their promised cooperation on infrastructure that helps third countries to replace fossil fuels and nuclear-based energy with produ uh, production with renewables. Uh, they should establish an annual seminar uh, seminar at the business level for hydrogen technology and commercial applications. So that's not at the governmental level, but more at the kind of business level. Um, and while finally the EU and Japan should seek to expand on existing cooperation with China and now under Biden with the United States, the EU and Japan, I would argue, must build a long-term special relationship for promoting cooperation uh, in renewable energy and greenhouse gas reductions that does not depend on cooperation with China and the U.S. The U.S. and frankly is particularly unreliable on this, and cooperation with China, as we've seen in many areas, can also be problematic. So the two need to build a kind of core coalition, uh, starting with themselves, uh, as the long-term most committed uh, states to re renewable energy and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and achieving uh, carbon neutrality. And I will end it there. I think I'm probably over time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for a, an inspiring presentation and also for a really uh, um, substantive overview that helps us to better understand where there are indeed linkages and uh, points for cooperation between uh, Japan and the EU in renewable energy. Um, we go right on to the next uh, presentation. And now I would like to call Marco Zappa talking about uh, Japan-EU cooperation uh, with Vietnam. Marco, please. Thank you, Verena, and thank you, Paul, for the insightful um, presentation. I would, um, first of all, like to share my presentation. And um, please um, give me just one second. Okay. 
Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, great. So um, I'm particularly thrilled being like um, a junior scholar to be part of this exciting webinar. And um, I think I, I already learned a lot from the first panel and I'm looking forward to, to this panel and to um, my co-panelists presentations as well. Paul already did it and um, I'm looking for articles as well. Um, I'm much of my presentation or, or, or well better said much of my paper has been already discussed in in the previous uh, previous panel but uh, still I would like to focus uh, my attention today um, on on a specific case study um, which I'm particularly attached to because it's it's been part of uh, my uh, PhD research you know Japan Vietnam's relation are also uh, very much under on their spotlight in recent years and um, there my, my, my assumption my argument today would be that there might be also forms of cooperation and coordination between um, the EU and Japan on what has been dubbed what has been called the little dragon some by, by you know some observers um meaning that we basically the EU and Japan and also the US are somehow um uh, investing money uh investing knowledge investing also in technology transfer on uh this uh, this country that is a developing country still but uh, to some extent um, follows along the line of uh, China's of its massive neighbors uh, on economic and political development, meaning, uh, of course, China. Um, so uh, I would start off by saying that, of course, due to historical and geographical uh, reasons, um, Vietnam has been trapped in what uh, Carla Tyre um, has defined the, so the, the tyranny of geography. Uh, and so politically and geographically, of course, Vietnam is much exposed to the People's Republic of China's uh, political and economic influence. Um, it's not surprising that, of course, uh, China and the PRC is uh, top, uh, you know, trade partner. It's Vietnam's top trade partner and has also uh, increased its presence through uh, investments and somehow um, involving um, Vietnam as well in its broad uh, geopolitical uh, strategy of the Belt and Road Initiative. So in, in response to this actually, um, and much as a path dependent strategy, uh, the government of Hanoi uh, and the Communist Party of Vietnam uh, leadership has always tried to, uh, at least since the, the end of the Cold War, has always tried to adopt and also since it's opening up with the Doi Moi uh, strategy, the renovation strategy that has been implemented since the late 1980s, uh, has been keen on pursuing uh, a multifaceted omnidirectional foreign policy and basically trying to make friends and rebuild friendly ties with the entire international community. Uh, also with um, old enemies such as the US, Vietnam has been the theater of one of the dreadful, most dreadful conflicts in, in, in the post-war era. Uh, but of course we have also uh, the EU and Japan um, and if we go back to the colonial era, of course, France has been uh, the, the occupying, an occupying power, a colonial power to Vietnam, to Indochina and to Vietnam specifically. And Japan as well has uh, occupied and ruled in, um, in, in co-dominion, let's say, with, with France, uh, at least for a few years in the 1940s. Um, however, uh, Vietnam most recently has benefited from the rapprochement with the international, the US-led international community, and of course also through its uh, ties to from, with China, uh, but particularly has been um, pursuing um, a, a keen strategy to make to to strengthen its alliance with uh, one uh, with 
the second, let's say, Asian power in the, in the field, which is Japan, um, extensively cooperating and um, signing uh, strategic partnerships. And especially in 2014, it has um, signed up uh, uh, to a, an extensive partnership for peace and prosperity in Asia. Um, meaning that the, um, what was back then only an economic uh, kind of relation has been transforming and evolving into something different, into something more uh, comprehensive. Um, to, in, in this regard, um, it might be useful and might, might be worth stressing that, for example, uh, the Vietnamese government, the Vietnamese leadership has um, expressed its um, appreciation, for example, to, um, uh, to Japan's proactive contribution to peace, Sekyokuteki Heiwa Sugi, that has been launched in 2013 by the Abe cabinet, by the second Abe cabinet, um, in parallel to enjoying a very uh, high degree of economic cooperation through uh, Japanese ODA, especially uh, attracting which were in, have, um, to a larger extent uh, been instrumental to attracting uh, foreign, uh, foreign investments in the country, at least since the mid 1990s. Um, basically, this, uh, this pretty much uh, draws the picture of, uh, of a strategic partnership and of uh, a strengthening alliance, a strengthening ties, strengthening ties between Vietnam and Japan, despite uh, all the limitation to this to these agreements, um, namely, uh, for example, the, the fact that Vietnam still has an autocratic uh, kind of uh, government uh, and is still ruled by a party state, as it's uh, as I said before, as I said before, um, as its neighbor China. Uh, however, um, again. Uh, uh, along the lines of economic cooperation, for example, uh, Japanese ODA have, have played also a huge role in uh, fostering, for example, security cooperation with uh, Vietnam, um, most significantly since 2015, when Vietnam, uh, Vietnam received through, uh, ODA, through the ODA budget um, contributions uh, in the form of um, dismissed uh, Japanese uh, patent Coast Guard vessels, which have been deployed and should constitute somehow the response to China's assertiveness in the South China Sea. Of course, Vietnam, despite its, uh, its, its closeness to China has, uh, as you may uh, all know, has its own disputes, territorial disputes on, on the South China Sea. And this can be also the theater for, uh, can, can, can open some room to uh, increase cooperation also between Japan and the um, EU. Um, as um, my, as uh, who preceded me actually in, uh, in the first panel this morning have uh, stressed, uh, have must, much stressed, um, we all know that the, uh, Japan and, and the EU have signed up to, um, let's say, a two-pronged or a three-pronged uh, kind of par partnership along the lines of the EPA and the SPA. I would not delve into, into this any longer. Uh, but of course, the, the most important probably um, agreement that, have been, that has been signed recently is that one that regards more specifically, uh, the sustainable partnership, the sustainable connectivity and quality uh, infrastructure, which is a, basically a, a global um, kind of uh, rebooting of the of the Japanese government uh, own uh, strategy on quality infrastructure, which has as its main target, of course, Southeast Asia, and Vietnam is uh, of course one of the most important recipients of this kind of. Uh, aid of this kind of investments in connectivity, <clears throat> especially because it's one of the most um, crucial actors in the Mekong subregion uh, along the uh, Mekong River in Southeast Asia. This has um, also opened up uh, new uh, allies for um, Vietnam's participation into trade and security agreements with other uh, partners that have that have somehow 
ties with Japan itself, namely India and the US. Um, I might um, we might remember of the port calls that have been conducted also by the US Navy in 2018. And uh, on another on, on another hand, we might say uh, also of the trade uh, agreements that have been signed between Vietnam and the EU. Uh, not uh, forgetting that the EU, in its uh, global strategy in 2016, has let's say stressed and has underscored the importance of uh, security. In East Asia, um, of, uh, it has stressed, it has underscored a direct connection between European prosperity and Asian security, meaning that um, we are not seeing direct cooperation in security issues, on security issues in that, in that area between the EU and Vietnam, for example, but we might see it in the uh, very near future. Uh, and Vietnam, and to, to finalize, to, to give you some final point for discussion, has been also involved in the Quad Plus arrangement, um, I guess on the initiative basically of, of the US, but, but still is taking part of important fora that have uh, as their declared aim, um, the target to the, the aim to somehow contain China in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific or in Asia Pacific. Um, this sort of uh, engagement by the US and the EU and Japan is somehow appreciated uh, at the level of business and intellectual academic elites in Southeast Asia. I just give you some, some data taken from the, the state of Southeast Asia uh, 2021 um, survey report compiled by the um, by the ICS in Singapore, uh, which shows clearly that um, e the EU and Japan are basically the most trusted powers in the region and uh, a more uh, stressed engagement, a more uh, definite engagement by these powers might be also uh, instrumental in in challenging, in rebalancing China's and Vietnam's own uh, asymmetries with China, um, um, and also uh, make up for a sort of lack of trust or a diminished trust in the US. Um, still, the COVID pandemic has proven to be a test case for um, much uh, for, for the US, the EU and Japan's engagement in Vietnam's affairs, um, given the fact that Vietnam has very lately actually discovered its COVID problem um, in just it's something that is really uh, recent in April or late April it started again, you know, to be hit by the so-called fourth wave um, and has seen a spike of uh, new in daily infections um, that have, uh, have fortunately, luckily enough, not resulted in a um, huge surge of the number of deaths, however. But still, um, Vietnam is today one of the lowest uh, vaccine uh, injection rates and, or the, the lowest rates of uh, fully vaccinated people in the region. This might have something to do also with the fact that for many months, it has basically, um, the Vietnamese government has indulged a bit uh, on its successes in containing the COVID infection in the first part of, uh, of the pandemic, especially uh, throughout to 20, uh, 2020. Um, but still, as I said, it has discovered it, uh, the problem, the COVID problem very, very lately. Um, it, how ha has Vietnam been capable of, for example, resisting to uh, China's aggressive vaccine uh, diplomacy, the so-called vaccine diplomacy, basically relying upon, um, upon we might call Western vaccines, <laughs> vaccines basically that were developed in Europe and the United States and maybe manufactured in India. Um, the India, uh, the surge of COVID cases in India has also resulted in, a, um, in basically in, in a sluggish uh, vaccine campaign in Vietnam too. 
And to cope with it, however, it has, the Hanoi government has um, resolved, has, um, has asked for help to, uh, the, from the international community, especially to Japan and the US. Um, also, there are pressure within, uh, pressures within Vietnam itself, especially from foreign businesses that are keen to see the business environment uh, somehow restored. And Vietnam is part, uh, is an integral part of many companies, many multinational companies, um, China plus one strategy. We might, might be worth uh, stressing this fact. Um, so it, the, the, Hanoi, the government in Hanoi has been exposed to this kind of pressures. Uh, please start your vaccination soon because we might, uh, this might affect you know, all the um, manufacturing chains, the global value chains and so on and so forth. Um, to, uh, if on the one hand, this has helped Vietnam to contain and to uh, be somehow, um, to, to find uh, somehow protection from China's uh, influence, um, it has not been sufficient, however, to basically um, to uh, liberate Vietnam from its own ge geographical tyranny, uh, because in the end, uh, through uh, you know intra-party channels, intra-state channels, China has been able, uh, however, to provide uh, Vietnam's uh, in the form of donation. Um, a, a huge batch, batch of uh, Sinopharm vaccine. Um, this has, uh, of course, spurred um, responses and has fostered, has provoked responses from the international community and from Japan itself, who has very recently uh, promised that it will uh, provide and supply uh, one million doses to Vietnam. Um, and the doses to Vietnam have been provided also through the COVAX facility, which is a very interesting uh, multinational effort to uh, provide vaccines to developing countries itself. Um, however, as I said, uh, the, the PRC influence is still there. Um, so to wrap up my, my uh, presentation, today's presentation, um, still Vietnam is uh, a country of geopolitical relevance and um, the enhancement of cooperation in security areas, connectivity, infrastructure, and so on, might also be the stage for increased cooperation between the EU and Japan. However, uh, policymakers in both the EU and Japan needs to consider the fact that there is a path dependence uh, in both uh, Vietnam's omnidirectional post-Cold War diplomacy, but also in the fact that the PR, the, the, the China's influence cannot be totally averted and the tyranny of, of, of geography is still there. Um, but still, there are many, uh, many factors that may lead to concluding that uh, Vietnam can actually be, uh, along with other Southeast Asian countries, um, the next frontier for EU, Japan, and of course, US cooperation at large. Um, this is also, demonstrated and shown by uh, the, you know, the very, um, uh, the, the data I, I tried to show uh, taken from the survey um, conducted by the ICS. So uh, this is it for me and I will stop there. Wonderful, Marco. Thank you very much for bringing this um, paper to the panel. I think we really got quite a lot of um, interesting insights on uh, Japan-EU cooperation in Vietnam, and I think it also fit very well into the overall uh, frame of our uh, meeting today, where we also talk about uh, implicitly or explicitly about the challenge that China poses to Japan and to the region and about EU-Japan cooperation also as um, uh, in, in, this, in this field. And I think that's also how you ended. And it's also a very good transition to um, Atsuko uh, Higashino, who will now give her presentation on the Japanese perspective on the EU-China-Taiwan relationship. Atsuko, please, the floor is yours. Okay, um, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good.
Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Asuko Higashino. Thank you very much for having me today. And uh, thank you, Julio, for having me. And thank you, Mia, for the wonderful organization. Okay, I will talk about EU China relationship from Japanese perspective. And um, I'm very sure that um, many of you have already made an excellent discussion concerning EU China. And um, uh, well, my original title has EU China Taiwan because, I, but but I decided to drop the Taiwan aspect uh, because um, uh, I think uh, it is uh, more, much more fruitful to talk about Taiwan issue when the European Parliament issued the uh, uh, first ever discussion paper in September. So this time I will focus on Japanese perspective vis-a-vis -vis EU China relationship. So uh, please allow me for the uh, this. Um, a small modification in terms of my um, topics. Okay, um, I'm very sure that many people have heard a lot about EU-China relationship already. And I just wonder whether I need to talk about EU-China relationship at this moment. And uh, I, I think it, it is the last session and everybody is tired. So I will focus myself to speak about media coverage of the uh, EU-China relationship and EU-Japan relationship as well, because it really reflects the very limited and unbalanced understanding for Japanese to understand the uh, priorities and important things about the EU-Japan relationship and how uh, also it's uh, really important to show that how uh, Japanese people are looking at EU-China relationship with a bit of criticism and also with a bit of prejudice as well. So the structure of this presentation, so um, I, as you already know, uh, the actual development of EU-Japan relationship has been very uh, astonishing and it has been excellent, mainly um, um, not least because of the EPA, SBA, but the, um, the fundamental question of this presentation is, is Japanese perspective balanced enough to have a fully fleshed relationship with the EU? Uh, is it not too biased? Is it not too filled with their wishful thinking or whatsoever? And does Japan collectively acknowledge the priorities of the EU cooperation, uh, EU? For the, for the sake of better cooperation and coordination. So uh, that's why I'll have a look at the media coverage of EU-Japan issues and also media coverage of the uh, EU-Chinese relationship and how Japan interpret the uh, EU-China relationship at this moment. So um, my argument is that um, Jap Japan, Japan is not putting too much emphasis in uh, the issue of China when we talk about EU-Japan relationship. So at the moment, it looks like EU-Japan relationship is really dominated by the issue of China. And also Japanese perspective regarding EU-China relationship, it's also not very balanced because uh, it is political, uh, potentially very critical to EU's approach and uh, saying that it is really prioritizing economy over uh, human rights, which is not really true in my view. And uh, it is uh, also, I have to say that Japan is silently welcoming the deterioration of EU-China relationship in uh, when we have a look at various reporting by media, uh, Japanese major medias. Okay, so I took up kind of five cases. Uh, the first case is EU-China uh, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CAI, uh, which came to the uh, principal agreement last December, but came to the freezing uh, several, uh, uh, one, one month ago. And also we need to have a look at the how Japanese media reported the EU strategy for cooperation in India Pacific. Okay, uh, you, US Japan summit looks a little bit irrelevant, but it is because um, I, I think uh, the Japanese media coverage really emphasized that the line that they used in US Japan summit in April 2021 is actually copied and pasted to Japan EU summit agreement or uh, joint, uh, joint statements. And also it's, uh, according to them, it's copied also to the G G G7 summit joint statement. So, um, so, so I'm gonna now um, describe how EU's approach vis-a-vis -vis China is described in Japanese media. 
And uh, the, in terms of sky in the first place, uh, the words that economic driven is very, very, very often used. Uh, it's originally used to describe EU, uh, sorry, uh, German, China nationship or Italian uh, China nationship, but nowadays it is largely used in order to describe EU China nationship as well. So uh, it's trying to kind of uh, reject the view that the EU foreign policy is value driven or norm driven. So I've been doing about normative power Europe for a long, long time, but uh, uh, it's now say that the, uh, the uh, lot, lot, um, overall atmosphere of Japanese media is that it is the EU's foreign policy is not value driven, not not driven, but they, it is economic driven. And uh, uh, the very, very uh, common phrase which is used for, uh, you know, that describe Kai is that uh, it is putting the economy before human rights. So I personally wouldn't think that this is a very fair argument because uh, when we had um, uh, RCEP uh, with China and when US and China had the uh, phase one trade deal, nobody uh, in Japan really uh, described that it is they're putting economy before human rights. So uh, if Kai is putting economy before human rights, the RCEP has to be described in that way, but it didn't, it didn't made in that way. And uh, when also when uh, Japanese media described Kai, it says that it is a diplomatic history, victory by China as it is trying to disturb EU, US nations, in particular the new um, uh, Biden administration. So uh, it says that it is, which is, uh, so it mainly used the win or lose sort of argument uh, largely in order to describe the Sky Agreement. Uh, Kai issue. And uh, on the contrary, when we have a look at the uh, EU strategy for Indo-Pacific, EU Japan summit and the G7 summit, uh, the emphasis is slightly different because it, it's had an excessive focus on the difference to China or the situation in South and East China Sea. And uh, whether Taiwan is really included in a joint statement, that's their uh, um, joint statement. So the countering China sort of argument is really um, uh, obvious in the, uh, all the coverage of me Japanese media. And uh, I think, uh, and also there has been a lot of arguments that Japan or Prime Minister Suga persuaded the EU to insert the reference to China or led the EU to insert the reference to China. I do wonder whether that's it's really the case. And uh, I think it is the, one of the very misleading or um, sort of um, media coverage in Japanese media as well. And also, uh, while Kai, as, just as I said, Kai is described as a diplomatic victory by China, this uh, EU strategy for Indo-Pacific or EU-Japan summit or G7 summit is largely described as a diplomatic victory by Japan for successful inclusion of such reference concerning China and Taiwan. So uh, as you can imagine, there's a very few references to other important issues. For example, when the, whenever you have a look at the uh, EU-Japan Summit Joint Statement or G7 Summit Statement, the important issue that came in the first place of the Joint Statement is the, uh, the COVID-19 issue, how to produce and disseminate vaccines. And also when it's come to EU-Japan Summit, it is Green Alliance, which is really, really important. And uh, uh, trade and digital is also important. Whenever we talked about the international security issue, China is not at all the only issue, which is of course mentioned in these um, um, paper, strat strategic papers or joint statement. It is about also about North Korea, Myanmar, Russia. And also when it's come to Chinese issue, the false neighbor issues are very, very important when it's come to G7 summit joint statement as well. But um, uh, it, that sort of, main issues which is actually being discussed in this forum is not really covered by Japanese media. So as you can already see, it is already 
very, very biased and very unbalanced. So I just gonna go through very quickly about how it, uh, how the actual paper says about the uh, uh, various issues uh, concerning EU Japan and EU China issue. So uh, it is the uh, Asashimbun uh, for uh, looking at the Akai and that uh, it's uh, rightly say that it is putting economy to uh, over to uh, human rights. Uh, so it is the mentioning about the diplomatic history by China to have um, a Kai with the EU in the last minute by the end of 2022, uh, 2020. And also uh, uh, it's combined the Chinese diplomatic victory uh, with, uh, of Alsep and Kai. It states that both it's very, very uh, astonishing diplomatic victory for, Japan, uh, for China. And also, it's Nihon Keza Shinbun. It's also uh, emphasized the aspect that the Kai is the attempt by China, which tries to um, um, dis, uh, take the distance uh, between uh, China, uh, Europe and the US. And also, uh, this is the reporting concerning uh, EU strategy for uh, Indo Pacific. So, um, it, when you, uh, I, I'm very sure that that many people who is looking at this webinar is uh, had the look at the uh, EU strategy to Indo Pacific already, and the uh, uh, difference to China is actually very small, and it didn't really make any different uh, difference at all in terms of Taiwan. But uh, uh, I think um, the, the most of the papers focused on the uh, uh, Chinese issues, well. And uh, when we have uh, also look at the EU Japan summit into uh, uh, sorry previous EU Japan summit, at, just as I can uh, show you, the uh, emphasis is like uh, COVID nineteen and the vaccination, the green alliance, etc. But it doesn't really. Uh, if you could have a look at the uh, Charles Michel's tweet and von der Leyen Street, nobody is really mentioning anything about China, but the uh, actual, uh, the reporting by Japanese paper is that uh, it's uh, about Taiwan actually, it made the first reference ever in joint statement between EU and Japan. And uh, so uh, the, uh, for uh, these papers, the uh, importance of Green Alliance, for example, and the COVID-19 treatment is really um, forgotten uh in many way and also um this is the uh, uh about the online summit of eu japan and also um uh, the indo-pacific really comes as the first why when if you have a look at the eu uh, indo-pacific strategy it comes at the very very bottom so there's a huge discrepancy between what is really actually mentioned and in what order in the Indo-Pacific strategy and how it is reported and covered in Japanese media. Okay. And also, um, this is the actual uh, G7 summit communique. And uh, I don't need to repeat the, my argument once again, but um, again, it's uh, the Taiwan comes first and the countering to China also uh, come to the headline. And this is the uh, kind of, I'm sorry to put it in a slide, but uh, this is a kind of um, awful uh, article which really copies what the uh, prime minister's office say to this newspaper, but uh, it gives the impression that the uh, Suga is really put, uh, making a huge input to the G7 summit. Where, uh, that, that's the, as you already know, the mentioning of China and mentioning of Taiwan is actually the, the um, uh, in line with the previous several me important meetings such as US Japan and uh, EU Japan also. So it's nothing new about this, but uh, uh, it tries to give an impression that the, uh, it is Prime Minister Suga who really urged the US and the EU to put Chinese issue in the joint statement. I don't repeat that. So um, let me come to the uh, very quick conclusion because I'm, I'm, I think I'm running out of time. And uh, uh, 
so what about state conclusion and recommendation? How to improve the situation? Because uh, it is really absolutely needed to have more balanced understanding or more balanced discussion in order to promote meaningful Japan-EU cooperation. So uh, for, for Japan, I think it is really necessary to understand the uh, actual, what, what is the actual focus point for the EU to, uh, in order to um, substantiate the cooperation between EU and Japan. And also, I think it is ab absolutely important for the European Peace Group to understand that Japan is obsessed really to the Chinese and Taiwanese issue to this extent. So I think uh, filling the gap, filling this gap is really actually uh, difficult, but really important. It is necessary to put the uh, cooperation forward. So what can we, can we say uh, concretely in order to improve the situation. So we need to have a wider or deeper in, uh, consideration concerning the implication of freezing the Kai, because now at the moment, Japan is really, uh, s seems to be silently welcoming the freezing of the Kai, but the, uh, for the side of the EU, the situation is quite serious. So it is not something to congratulate, not at all, because uh, 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 freezing of the Kai means that the EU businesses cannot really have a, a good level playing field in Chinese market. So it is really obvious. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't really have to repeat that the uh, EU uh, business is in a very, very um, uh, unfavorable situation because they are in East Asia. Uh, we've got ALSEP and between US and China, they've got phase one trade deal. So uh, I think it is really putting the EU ex in the exclusive a uh, exclusively difficult situation uh, with it, without any sort of uh, investment agreement with China. So for the side of Japan, we really need to discuss the wider implication of the freezing of Kai. So, and uh, uh, as a partner, we need, really need to discuss how to move uh, to the next stage together. And also, uh, I think one of the biggest thing that I, for me is that the uh, uh, EU, Japan connectivity partnership is now starting to be forgotten. And uh, it, it was uh, agreed in September 20, uh, 2019 uh, between uh, Abe administration and the other uh, EU. But they, uh, um, the political willingness in order to utilize this partnership, it's now strengthening. And uh, I don't really think that Suga administration is really positive about using the making the best use of this connectivity issue. So I, uh, the only way to get out of this uh, um, um, stalemate is that, that making the best of the uh, B3W, uh, building better worlds um, initiative. But uh, I think that uh, uh, we need a um, very substantial discussion once again in order to substantiate this uh, B3W uh, initiative as the way to counter the uh, BRI. Uh, and also um, several days ago, um, uh, the uh, very interesting argument was uh, introduced. Um, at the, uh, I think it is Euractive. It is about the concept of cooperative containment concerning China. It is the, uh, 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 proposed by the guy who called uh, Clever and Moose. And uh, uh, it says that it essentially says that Europe and like minded alliance will give a potentially tough and diplomatically consistent response when, for example, Taiwan is threatened or concentration camps are set up to re-educate minorities such as Uyghurs. So uh, uh, we really need to consider seriously whether this kind of cooperative containment vis-a-vis -vis China is possible at all. And if so, how we can move on to this uh, uh, substantiate this um, very interesting concept. So thank you very much. 
I thank you very much, Atsko, for uh, a very interesting um, and actually fascinating paper showing how the, the Japanese media perception and the uh, presentation of uh, issues by by EU um, policymakers how they diverge. No? So that's actually quite a, a, an interesting input. Thank you very much. And without any further ado, I would like to ask uh, Professor Yoko Iwama to give her uh, comments. And I would suggest in the interest of time that after the discussion, we uh, go right into the uh, Q&A. So in that way, dear uh, participants, also dear uh, people in the audience, if you have any question, um, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A function, and I will then uh, be happy to pick them up in the uh, discussion afterwards. But first, Ivama Sensei, please. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the organizers, Julio Mira and uh, Indusan, for having me in this panel. It's an honor to be among such distinguished specialists. Now, uh, the three papers were so uh rich in its content it makes it quite a challenge to comment uh but i will try to reframe myself and concentrate on several points first to paul midfoot's paper and uh, thank you so much for the great input about energy um i have one question and one comment one is the centrality of the hydrogen that you have sort of you know, you, you emphasize hydrogen so much in your conclusion. What makes you so sure that this is the, the key of the energy policy of the future? And who is likely to kind of benefit from this uh, technology shift? And um, who, in your opinion, is, like to, uh, is likely to sort of dominate or is in a good position to, to benefit from this energy shift? Uh, the second point is a comment. Um, the elephant in the room of your presentation was nuclear power. Uh, you didn't really <laughs> go into it, but uh, it, it's a big deal in Japan, especially. And then if you look to Europe, it's also kind of very different from country to country. Um, Japan, I think, we are virtually in a, in a sort of a phased uh, exit from nuclear power, or at least decrease of reliance on nuclear power, but nobody's ready to admit it. And that's a huge problem. Um, and there's so much vested interest in nuclear, civilian nuclear energy industry, that it makes it very difficult to adopt a kind of a, a positive sounding strategy of exit from nuclear power, but I think we need it. Um, I've spent the last 10, 15 years dealing with nuclear weapons and civilian nuclear energy uh, technologies, and they are closely related, which makes it very difficult for people to uh, talk, um, I don't know, in a, in a re refrained and uh, civilized manner about nuclear technology, they get very excited <laughs> and emotional. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's reasonably so, uh, but I think it's about time we talk uh, professionally and pragmatically about nuclear technology. Um, many older generation get excited about this because they believe uh, that keeping the whole range of uh, nuclear and space technology is closely related uh, with uh, guarding our independence. And having Chinese uh, nuclear power right in front of us, we get more excited about it. Um, but I don't really see a future as in nuclear power with all the difficulties related to the technologies and uh, nobody really knows what to do about nuclear waste. So I my myself is really kind of four phased uh, exit from nuclear power, but we need an open discussion about this. And another thing, so I think Europe, Japan dialogue in this respect is uh, definitely needed. I mean, we need to put a period to our fast breeder uh, program that is dead, but nobody's willing to say that. And then um, one thing that really concerns me is the sort of spread of civilian nuclear energy to developing world. 
China and Russia is ready to export nuclear uh, power technology to many other countries without really caring for the safety or the waste. And I'm really concerned about it. And I think uh, Japan and Europe has a kind of a liability to speak up about this, but Japan is burdened with so many um, things from the past that it can't really freely talk out about it. Now, different countries in Europe have different experiences and past with the, the nuclear uh, technology, uh, but I feel that Europe is a little bit more freer to talk uh, professionally about this problem. Uh, so that's uh, for Paul Mitford. I move to Marco Zappa. And uh, again, thank you for the very interesting paper, which was full of lots of interesting points. But I take that your focus was Vietnam. And I, I'm not sure what you meant by the word pivot. Uh, so I would uh, appreciate uh, a little bit more clarification on the choice of that word. Um, now, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience at GRIPS. Um, as uh, Verena kindly explained, I have, well, I actually have two and a half hat as a director of programs here. And um, we at GRIPS uh, educate students from all over the world, 60-70% are from overseas, and most of them are uh, mid-career uh, bureaucrats uh, from different ministries. And many, many, many come from Asian countries. So uh, I, I mean, day, in my day-to-day -day experience, I, I, I teach uh, students from ASEAN countries as well as South um, Asia. Um, and then one of the programs we have, Maritime Security, uh, Safety and Security Policy Program, MSP, is about capacity building. This is financed by JICA. And we are um, doing capacity building for coast guards of uh, Asian countries, uh, which has a very political context, as you will probably guess. And this was this program was just kind of strongly backed by the Abe administration, um, but it is still ongoing, and we are trying to sort of reform it and rebuild it. Uh, so one of the things we are doing is, in addition to the JICA financed uh, Asian part, we also want input from other developing countries to participate by their own financing, send their Coast Guards and the maritime related people to um, join in uh, this capacity building. So I, I'm going to reach out to you in due time. <laughs> but um, what I want to share with you is the experience I had and I want your opinion on it. We get bureaucrats all from all over the world. Personally, I find it relatively easy to connect with former British Empire countries because of the similarity of their bureaucracy. <laughs> they, uh, they all have this, uh, India has this Indian civil service, and then countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, they all have very similar bureaucracy and armed forces which makes it very much easier for us to approach uh, and find the right place to communicate. And then they usually have English as their official language, which makes it doubly uh, easier for us to communicate. Whereas in countries like Vietnam, um, finding a candidate with sufficient English capability is the first challenge. And then with Vietnam, we've always had difficulty uh, finding the right partner to, to speak to. Uh, it's not only about MSP, it's in all programs. We want to get the good uh, candidates who can be, you know, the top-notch bureaucrats of, the, of uh, 10, 20 years uh, from now. Uh, we're getting the students in the um, range of early 30s mainly. So we want them to come here, make friends, and then go back home and then you know, usually uh, eventually climb up the bureaucracy ladder. Now, Vietnam is one of the most challenging countries to find the right candidate. Uh, you know, we try lots of sort of, we knock on lots of doors and windows. Um, our information usually ends up in, in most unexpected places. So um, what, you know, what can we do about this? Um, we, 
uh, have different grammar or bureaucracy here. And Vietnam, I, I really don't know if they made up their bureaucracy on Soviet model or Chinese model, or do they have uh, their indigenous model? I really don't know this. Um, the, the British Empire type is much easier for us to find out the grammar and find the right door to knock on. <laughs> so um, this is a challenge that we face in, when we approach different countries in Asia. Who do we speak to? How do we communicate with the best partner? So I would appreciate your uh, input on this. And, and then I would like to connect to Atsuko Higashino's uh, presentation, oh, to which I quite agree. <laughs> and as you know, I, I've been one of the persons who's been pointing out that uh, this uh, news coverage is quite biased, that it doesn't really reflect uh, the continentals and so on, and especially the German bias towards China. Uh, but putting that aside, um, one question would be, you know, where would you uh, going after Malcolm, and this is coming very soon. So, uh, I, I mean, I would put it to all the participants. Where is you going after Malcolm? Uh, and then the second question is, um, let's go, you continuously talked about EU-China relationship or EU-Japan relationship, EU-Japan strategic partnership and so on. But now we are in a, era, uh, EU minus UK. So what do we do about this? <laughs> um, EU no longer contains Britain, which actually is one of the best partners, partner for Japan. Somehow we find it much easier to talk to London than to Brussels or Rome or Paris or Berlin. Um, I guess it's uh, partly linguistic, partly cultural, uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, lots of Japanese feel more at home in London than in other capitals. Uh, I mean, numerically speaking, I'm not talking about individuals in this panel. <laughs> um, so uh, now EU is without Britain. What do we do about this? How do we keep up the dialogue? Uh, and my question would be, do we need to re-nationalize our dialogues and re-nationalize our strategy rather than having a, a sort of a, um, an umbrella EU Japan talks? Should we kind of target specific issues to specific countries to get more result? Okay, that will be the end of my comments. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ibama Sensei, for inspiring comments that will certainly um, lead our discussion into interesting fields, especially the last one, I think, a EU-Japan collaboration or cooperation post-Brexit, I think, would actually uh, be enough uh, material to have an, a, an individual panel just devoted to this topic. But thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have asked the attendees to post their questions in the uh, Q&A. We got two questions here uh, that were both directed to Professor Higashino. Uh, one question is um, you talked about um, in your paper um, about the EU, uh, about the Japanese perception of um, EU China, but um, here the question is, how do the Japanese media or have you found in your research any references on how the Japanese media on the, uh, is actually reporting on the EU, putting pressure on Japan to address a number of domestic human rights issues like the death penalty, for example, which is indeed a big issue because normally we have this EU policy that there is no cooperation with countries that actually use the death penalty. So in that way, um, that would be one question. And this is something that the European Parliament has mentioned several times in resolutions on Japan. Has there been any resonance in the Japanese public debate of these on, on these issues. So that was the first question. And the second question um, relates to um, further areas of EU-Japan cooperation. And that may also be something uh, that maybe uh, could also be addressed by, by Paul Mitford in his answer, because the question is on cooperation in research and innovation. And um, there has been um, 
and inclusion of Japan in the, into the Horizon Europe framework program um, that seems to be intended by both sides and would make great sense scientifically, technologically, and economically. And if I may add as chair, would also be a good way to actually move forward on the cooperation in renewable energy and related research. Um, but things very much seem to be stuck and nothing moves. So in that way, the question is, how um, is this um, how does this refer to um, or what is the current position in this field and especially the Japanese position? And then if I, if I may abuse my position as chair and also add a, a question uh, to Marco Zappa, um, what I've seen in Japan, Vietnamese cooperation is also a massive investment in capacity building. So you have talked about cooperation in ODA, in trade and in security. But um, there seems to be parallels also to at least what Germany is doing. We have the Japanese Vietnamese University that is funded by, by Japanese private businesses. And we also have a German Vietnamese University and both are actually trying to do the same thing. And maybe also uh, bringing um, an answer to the problem that uh, Eva Masense has raised in her comment to actually also train people who are then uh, potential uh, collaboration partners and also pointing to talking to partners on the Vietnamese side. So I wonder uh, whether you have looked into that in your research. And now we go to the answering uh, session and I would like to give Paul Midford the opportunity to answer first. And I'm very sorry to uh, uh, interrupt. Uh, there is a final question from Yoshizaki Tomonori, I think, from NEEDS. Ah. Yes, and this I is a saw question it. Thank for you. everybody, just yes. because we're running out of time. So everybody, could you answer this uh, very easy yes, question? Me, yeah, let me read the question. And that's, um, do you think Japan is overemphasizing and or obsessed by China issues? Well, EU, the EU already regards China as a systemic challenge. So maybe wouldn't that be enough? So yes, thank you very much, Julio, for pointing this out. That just came in as I was wrapping up the questions. But let's pick that up, pick up on that one as well. Uh, so, Paul, please. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much to Iwama Sensei for those excellent comments, uh, which I found enlightening and uh, which I largely agreed with. Um, but I want to start off with that last question about is uh, Japan China obsessed? My first reaction, if we're talking about security and politics, my answer is absolutely yes. If we're talking about renewable energy, I'm not quite as sure, just because I don't think China, Japan fully understands the scale of the kind of uh, of China's challenge in terms of renewable energy technologies, and also just the transformation that's coming. Um, Japan is, uh, you know, the first major uh, battery powered uh, electric vehicle is the Nissan Leaf, which I have owned now my second one. But that, you know, they've not really penetrated in Japan very much. Japan is really lagging behind. It's still very much stuck in uh, conventional automobile technology and Chinese EVs are beginning to sweep over Europe and will uh, sweep over other places and um, Japan is a real danger that its automobile companies are being left behind and will be left with a lot of expensive legacy assets that they can't use. So I think when it comes to renewable energy and technology in this area, Japan actually has to focus more on China and, and how big the challenge is. Um, and, and that's also, of course, cooperation as well as uh, competition. And you know, co uh, competition in terms of renewable energy technology ultimately will benefit us all. So in that sense, we don't have to think about China as necessarily an opponent. Um, on Professor Iwama's uh, excellent uh, questions, the centrality of, of hydrogen, is it really so central? Well, again, getting back to battery, uh, battery technology, that has been improving much faster than most people thought. The prices, as I point out, have been falling. The capacity has been rising. And so in the short run, actually, uh, battery powered cars and other technologies are outperforming uh, hydrogen in terms of their incremental improvements. So in the short run, um, hydrogen is not doing as well as was expected. I, but I think there's an expectation in the long run, hydrogen will catch up and it has some advantages. It's more environmentally friendly, um, you know, because all these batteries, although they're, the battery life of electric, uh, of, of lithium ion batteries is turning out to be much better than we thought, they do die and they do have to be disposed or recycled or something. Um, 
Tesla's trying to squeeze all the cobalt out of their batteries, but um, uh, that's a challenge. And um, so uh, hydrogen is much more environmentally friendly in the sense that you, uh, the only pollution it produces is water. Uh, so that's an advantage that hydrogen has. Um, and I think in the, so I think in the long run, hydrogen will probably be central, um, but it may take a while. Uh, another issue is now who benefits from it? Well, Japan obviously thinks they do. And Japan is, I would argue, the leader right now. Now, we've looked at other technologies like PV solar, where Japan was the leader. They developed the technology. They were the leader until 2005 and very shortly, quickly. First, they lost it to Germany within a year or two. And then two or three years later, China became the global hegemon in PV solar. So there's the Japan has to worry about that happening with hydrogen again. And that's, I think, again, why Japan and the EU should cooperate in this area. Now, there may be competition between the Japan and EU in terms of how much their companies benefit, but they might want to think about an alliance between them so that um, they can compete with, with China in some way. That, that's my basic thought about that. Nuclear power is the elephant in the room. Uh, I agree with your comment there. No one is really uh, willing to admit that Japan is exiting from nuclear power. I've, I wrote a, a book chapter on this recently. Uh, DPJ's policy was exit from nuclear power by 2030s. Um, uh, Abe administration doesn't admit it, but their de facto policy is by the 2050s. But as you say, uh, uh, the Abe administration didn't say that. Abe was personally very pro-nuclear. And, and his critics were basically buying into this and saying, well, Japan is going back to nuclear power, which was never the case, I think. Uh, after after 311. So, um, but I, your point is well taken, which I didn't note in my in my work on this, which is admitting this is the fact is a good thing, and Japan should do that. I think you're right that the EU can help Japan in this area, to to kind of uh, uh, help it decommission and uh, shut down its nuclear power plants. On the other hand, Japan can help the EU in that way too, because Japan is going to have to be shutting down a lot of nuclear reactors, even in the short run, and is already starting to decommission them. Your point about the connection to nuclear weapons is a really good one, and that has come into the debate, um, whether Japan has to maintain civilian nuclear power to have maintain a nuclear option. Um, I would personally argue Japan can maintain a nuclear option for developing nuclear weapons without maintaining a civilian nuclear power industry. I do not think the two have to be related. It might be more expensive, but uh, I think Japan can maintain that nuclear option and will probably want to maintain nuclear competence and technology for a long time. And frankly, the process of decommissioning all these nuclear reactors requires Japan to maintain a high level of nuclear competence for a long time. Uh, finally, about exporting nuclear technology to third world countries, I'm not so worried about that because many third world countries are abandoning their nuclear power plans. Uh, Vietnam just abandoned their plans to buy nuclear power plants. Um, uh, Taiwan's not developing, but they did. Uh, and I think the writing is on the wall that nuclear power is just not competitive with uh, renewables. Now, yes, they can perhaps buy reactors from China and Russia, but even then, that's not going to be a cheap option. It's going to involve the investment, a lot of infrastructure locally. And by comparison, it's much cheaper, easier, and far faster just to invest in wind turbines or solar panels. The Middle East is an interesting case. I think the UAE has bought one or two nuclear reactors, but overall the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the main thrust is away from nuclear power and into massive mega solar plants that are far cheaper. So I, I think nuclear power is gonna lose out and is losing out in third world countries. That, that's my, my sense. Maybe you have some counter examples, but thank you again for those comments. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we hand over right to Marco Zappa, please, Marco. Thank you, Verena. And thank you, Professor Iwama, for, uh, for your questions. Uh, I will start off by um, answering uh, your, your, to your, hopefully answering to your doubt about the, the use of Pivot. Um, I tried to, well, it's basically a, a rhetorical kind of <laughs> tool that I, I that I, that I used also in my paper in my presentation, um, basically taking uh, drawing upon uh, Carlisle Tire, um, and not, again uh, this expert on uh, Vietnamese um, Viet Vietnamese politics and and economy, and in one of his papers it actually come out the expression is or well the the point is Vietnam the true pivot to Asia in basically the U.S pivot to Asia strategy. So is Vietnam 
the, the central, the core of that very strategy, uh, along with you know strengthening the ties with um, with existing partners and allies such as Japan and South Korea, in order to uh, constrain, in order to um, in a way contain China as well. So this was um, what actually came to my mind when I used the, the, the word uh, pivot in my presentation and paper. Um, moving on to um, your, uh, you know, the, your experience uh, at GRIPS, um, I don't think I'm in, you know, the, the right position to give you advice on this, but um, I will just uh, take this opportunity to, um, to, 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 to say a little bit more about uh, my previous research, which was, and I, I also, um, I'm also trying to, to answer to Verena's question, um, which was actually focused on uh, capacity development and on, particularly on a series of scholarships that uh, the, on, on a scholarships program that the Japanese government still has um, up and running, uh, which is the JDS program, which is actually uh, aimed at fostering human, uh, human resource development within uh, developing countries, bu bureaucracies and uh, public administrations. Uh, I was, I actually, well, my sample, the sample that I chose for my research was pretty limited um, due to time constraints. Unfortunately, in, in Italy, the PhD program is just three years. And so we need to, you know, make uh, out the most of it. And, um, but anyway, I was lucky enough to go to Vietnam in a, in a way uh, as embedded in one university delegation to, to, the, to the Vietnamese government, in one, uh, which, was, um, which saw uh, the particip participations of um, professors from different public universities and public and private universities in uh, Japan to Vietnam to make you know, um, the, the selection of candidates uh, to be enrolled in this sort of programs. And um, I was uh, particularly uh, struck by the fact that um, you know, public administration in Vietnam uh, is keen to um, you know, provide uh, their personnel to these kind of programs, but on a very limited time. And um, especially, you know, the, the core, the program, the scholarship pro program offers two years scholarship for a master degree, but, uh, you know, in the Iken Kokan, in the uh, ideas exchange between the Japanese delegation and the Vietnamese delegation, there was this point uh, being raised by a uh, 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 I, I guess a secretary, uh, ministries, secretary general, uh, uh, ministries of investment, Vietnamese ministry of investment, secretary general, or vice secretary general, sorry, I, I'm, uh, I don't really recall it, but anyway, uh, he asked for to Japanese, to the Japanese side to provide shorter programs. So in a way, um, this might, um, might, might respond to my, my answer to Professor Iwama's question, what can we do? How, how is it, why is it so difficult to, to cope with probably um, people from Vietnam, um, bureauc bureaucrats uh, coming to Japan to study um, originally from Vietnam? Because there are still, and this I think, um, I, I try to stress it also in my paper, uh, the Vietnamese state is some, somehow enmeshed in different networks. The one is, uh, you know, the party and, uh, you know, former Soviet uh, communist bloc, uh, which is a network that expands to China, that of course has its main node in uh, communist China. And then, uh, of course, the liberal uh, kind of block, uh, which uh, centers somehow around Japan and the US. And so I think it's, it's difficult also to, to, to balance in these two poles. Thank you very much, Marco. And um, the last uh, person on the panel to answer, but not least, is Atsuko. Please. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wama Sensei, and also for Verena Sensei for um, picking up wonderful questions. Uh, in, uh, when it comes to Wama Sensei's question concerning the uh, Europe after Melco or EU Japan relationship after Melco, I'm one hundred percent sure that you know the better answer than myself. But um, if I may combine the two questions that posed by you, I mean, the uh, EU after Melco or Germany after Melco or the EU after Brexit and the EU China next EU China relationship after Brexit. Um, uh, if I may combine the two questions at the same time, I think um, in general, the Japanese publics are in a transition period, if I may put it in that way, that uh, Britain is has really left the EU. So um, I think many, as, just as you mentioned, many Japanese people couldn't really believe, uh, didn't really want to believe that the, uh, Britain is really leaving the EU because that it was uh, one of the best partner for Japan uh, to talk to. So, uh, well, kind of for many Japanese people, Europe, it's kind of identical to the United Kingdom. So they, but it, it's left the EU in, in, in any way. But the, uh, for the past, like, 12 or 19 months, I can see the huge transition in the uh, uh, emotional or, or sort of um, uh, uh, Japanese kind of transition. We, and uh, seeing that the UK has really left the EU and now seeing the e, uh, UK as a uh, TPP partner for uh, the new potential TPP partner, for example. And um, uh, so uh, as for the EU actors, there are many Japanese people are starting to put their eyes on Germany and France. And uh, it is uh, really reflected to the expectation in terms of the uh, EU strategy to Indo-Pacific because they already know that uh, France and Germany is a, it's a very important uh, actor when it's come to the EU strategy to Indo-Pacific. So uh, at, at this moment, I think the uh, Japanese general perception is really mixed. They put a lot of expectation to France and Germany, in particular Germany, and uh, and uh, but at the same time, they know that Germany and France is kind of has got a mild position vis-a-vis -vis China. So uh, it, it's kind of a roller coaster um, emotions that uh, the expectation is getting high and the expectation drops when they know reality, etc. So uh, I think it is really difficult at the moment to say it what really the Japanese wider publics considers the uh, EU-China relationship or EU-Japan relationship after Brexit. But the, uh, I hope, that that's my wishful thinking, that the, I hope that in one or two years, it's come to the uh, uh, convergence, sort of, sort of conversion, and uh, see that the uh, uh, EU-Japan relationship or EU-China relationship and how Japan can deal with that in the context that the uh, uh, Britain doesn't really belong to the European Union anymore. So um, I I know that it is not really making any sort of uh, specific answer, but this is my impressionistic um, in a kind of observation. And also, Verona says, thank you very much for picking up uh, three excellent questions. Uh, uh, as for the uh, question put by uh, Professor Vietrek, uh, thank you so much uh, for the important question because uh, in terms of the uh, EU's pressure vis-a-vis -vis Japan, in terms of death penalty and gender issues and uh, labor issues, for example, I, I think I I'm very sure that the I and the Yama Sensei can talk about this issue for ages, but uh, I think uh, I, overall response from Japanese wider publics to this sort of pressures from e, uh, European Parliament and EU in general is really, you know, um, ignoring this sort of pressure. And uh, uh, many of you may remember that the uh, uh, EU, e, European Union in general or your, your EU countries in general has got a serious concern about the uh, gender issue, for example. And uh, uh, so uh, we, uh, several months ago, we, uh, the uh, se several embassies in Japan, uh, your European embassies in Japan made a uh, Twitter movement, that, uh, which is called, we uh, don't be silent or something like that, uh, concerning the uh, gender discrimination issues. And uh, this there has been a huge repercussion from the wider audience that that, that uh, saying that, that they, uh, there's no room for the uh, European country to say anything about the uh, uh, human rights or discrimination in the 
in, in Japan. So I think Japan has been very, very stubborn in general in to listening to European Parliament issues. So um, to be very sarcastic, what's the difference between Japan and China if they did, don't really listen to the uh, friendly advice by European countries? So this is my you know, uh, huge resentment uh, concerning this issue. And also, Professor Cooper, thank you very much for um, touching upon the uh, research and innovation issue. This is also a very interesting and a very important question because uh, as I 100% agree with you that the, uh, the uh, cooperation between the EU and Japan in terms of the very important issue of research and innovation has not been advanced sufficiently. And uh, I think it, this uh, situation is really awkward because uh, it is not the, something like that. We have to pick the security issue with China and say do, do nothing else at all. Uh, but uh, currently, I think yeah, I think the, uh, the China, EU and Japan issue is really shedding a negative light on the other area of cooperation, such as research and innovation, just as you mentioned. So I do agree that this is not really moving forward. And, but they are, I think, a very concrete sort of um, interaction and uh, communication between the two would hopefully um, uh, improve the situation. And uh, so the, everything is coming back to the Professor Yoshizaki's question. Thank you. Hello, Yusuke Sensei. Thanks for listening. And so I do agree that they are uh, uh, in all my question lead to your question that they are uh, uh, Japan is over uh, over uh, emphasizing or, uh, you know, uh, obsessed to the uh, security uh, side issue of EU China relationship and uh, Chinese domination to the Eastern Asia in general. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this concludes this panel and I hand over to Marie Söderberg for some final closing remarks. Apologies again, we went a little bit over, but it was such a fascinating discussion and Julio uh, agreed that it was okay to let it run a little longer. So thank you very much from my side for the contributions, the uh, comments and questions. And now I hand over to Marie for the closing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I must say it's fascinating. We have had a rather large audience staying on <clears throat> since 8.30 this morning and even going over time, 15 minutes, listening to the conversation about EU Japan. I think it has been a very fascinating morning. And first of all, I want to thank you all the speakers. I really enjoyed your input into this conference. It's been really good to have you and you've been on very different topics. And I think this has provided a good picture of EU-Japan relations from various angles. I also want to thank you, nice, thank you all the organizers, which is quite a long list. So it's, uh, uh, of course, the EU, European University Institute, the global governance programs in, in Florence. Julio, you put a lot of efforts into this one. Thank you very much. And all the, yes, really, and all the, um, uh, Policy papers will be published by them, so you can read it afterwards and rethink uh, again what your ideas are. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, Japanese German Center in Berlin, and, uh, who have sponsored us, and uh, Verena, the Frey University, and the Graduate School of East Asian Studies. And the European Institute of Japanese Studies at Stockholm School of Economics and also the European Japan Advanced Research Network. And this is a network uh, working on EU-Japan relations. And just to pre-warn you, we are having a conference in Berlin, November 25 to 26. Uh, hopefully live or mixture of live uh, and uh, web-based ones. So we can continue our discussions then. Also, thank you, Mia, for all the, the, uh, the um, administrative help. 
Uh, I also think that I want to say something about EU-Japan relations at the moment. We've had the uh, president, the US President Biden in Europe touring around. He has been meeting uh, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, among others. And he's emphasizing that the US is back again. We've heard this for a long time, actually, since the conference earlier this year also. And I think we all are very happy with this and agree that it's a good thing, but we shouldn't stop here. We should use this opportunity to actually, when we have a good president and we have this going on, to continue building the European Japanese connections even stronger. We never know when we will need them again. And we both have our own agendas, which might not exactly be the US ones. So let's keep on building EU-Japan relations in, in various ways. I would like to encourage that really. And we have something going on here with also the US, but even EU-Japan bilateral and multilateral things are very, very important. Uh, so, we are players after all, <laughs> not just bystanders, as Axel suggested. <laughs> we will have some action and we're going to see to it that there is some action going on, at least intellectually, that's what we are here for. So, uh, by, agree, this, uh, by this, I want to conclude and uh, thank everyone and hope to see you again in November. 25 to 26. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you very much. And thank you very much. Also. Thank you.